Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Many viewers will be aware of my coverage of the endeavours of two independent thinking historians, Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett. If you want to learn more about their work, please follow this link. Today's guest has been closely collaborating with Wilson and Blackett for the last four years and is on a crusade to revive their work and encourage people to follow on from their work by searching for and sharing new historical discoveries. He's already had some success bringing awareness to Britain's hidden history with his YouTube channel and website. Welcome, Ross Broadstock. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. All right, it's great to have you here, and I've been meaning to get you on the show for quite a while now. Um, now, you and I met, I think, first at one of my lectures in Kefili, maybe three years ago, something yeah, like I that. Yeah, I think the Merthyr ones before that. Before actually. that, yes. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so about f four, four years ago. And um, can you get, first give us just a little bit of background about yourself in terms of you know, how did you come to find out about the, the work of Wilson and Blackett and what brought you to that? Uh, maybe a little bit of your own background as well. Okay, well, I'm, I'm delighted that you um, asked that question because like most people I speak, I, I found a discovered it through your channel. And I was actually looking uh, on a completely separate topic. And the, you could see the, the thing there, you know, uh, Welsh forensic historians caught my eye and I started watching it. I, I, I just amazed I'd never seen any of this before. I mean, I've been in history all my life. Why had I never heard any of this before? What's it all about? Mm -hmm. And I was immediately hooked into it. And, and that got off and running. And the amazing thing is how many other people I speak to also discovered their work through your channel. Right. I mean, if my own background, I mean, I was ex extremely mainstream most of my life. I worked in um, London in marketing, uh, sort of selling advertising space. I organized exhibitions, that kind of thing. Always interested in history, always followed that. And then uh, about nine, ooh, how was my oldest son now? He's 13, almost 14. So about nine, 10 years ago, my little boy said to me one day, I was doing a little history of the 20th century with him. Mm -hmm. And we went through sort of a little very potted history for a young child about World War One and World War Two, And he turned around and said to me, hang on a second, he said, I thought you said Germany had no money after World War One," And I was like, yes. So how did they afford all those tanks and everything from World War Two then? Mm -hmm. I was like, that's a really good question. I'll look into that. <laughs> and then you open up the doors and then yeah. one thing leads to another topic and so many things you think are true so aren't. You, and that's right. what ended up on your channel, yeah. So you looked into the funding of Adolf Hitler then? Yes, which, all that stuff. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah, another, yeah. That's a huge, huge. World War Two is another. Yeah. We had enough trouble already with controversial history from the 6th century, so right. I'll stay clear of the 20th century, right. but yes. Yeah, okay, well, I first got in touch with Wilson and Blackett uh, through Adrian Gilbert. I met Adrian Gilbert at a conference in, I think it was about 2009. I then went to see Wilson and Blackett after I'd heard about their work. And then not long after that is when they had this very odd uh, attack on on Baron Blackett. This this right. bomb was put under his bed, and he, he was the, he, he was nearly killed. Yes. So yes. that that really fascinated me, and that, that was that's what compelled me to help them and get involved in exposing you know w what's going on here. Wh why are these guys being targeted? Mm -hmm. So my collaboration with them sort of started then around about 2010, 11, and then it went up until I moved to Wales, where I was un unable to keep in touch with them then. So that was probably to, to about 2016. And right. during that period, I would, I would go and visit them maybe once a fortnight, have dinner with them. Oh, as often as that, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and I was obviously selling a lot of their books on my website, uh, which they were very grateful for. They had mm -hmm. this huge cellar full of books that yeah, just I, I hadn't shifted. And that's why I bought my first books from your website, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, and um, so I really sort of... I had less contact with them from about 2016 onwards, but you you then endeavoured to go and see them yourself. Yes. Sort of 2017, 2018, would it be? So just tell us, so you, you, you felt so passionate about their work that you wanted to actually go up to Newcastle and go meet them. Yes, well, the, the first thing that caught my interest, I mean, all of it was fascinating, but the books were out there and it was all happening. But in the book Moses in the Hieroglyphs, in there, just, just buried away in this big, you know, 400-page book, is how they cracked reading Egyptian hieroglyphs, mm -hmm. which to me was, that's like a Nobel Prize or something right there. You can yep. read hieroglyphs. No one's done this before. Mm -hmm. And it worked so brilliantly. 
So that was actually my first line of interest because at the time, it, it seemed like you were selling the books and they kept promoted and the work was available. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going up there to say, right, I just want to do a book about hieroglyphs because I think this, this is, is lost in that big book. This needs its own mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. That was my first interest. But then what you realize, I mean, that some of the, the sort of yeah. the side of things I don't like to get into is more your channel about the trouble they were getting and the, the attacks yeah. on them and all that kind of stuff, realized that all their work was effectively being censored. You couldn't get hold of it. Mm -hmm. So people were setting up things and getting closed down. And I was like, right, well, I'm going to make the books available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, this is one thing. Uh, the difference between myself and Ross is <laughs> Ross steers clear of of politics and just bad behaviour. Let's say. <laughs> he's, he's interested. In, you're interested yes. in the history because it's it's fascinating enough, and it's well. Well, let, well let me, I, let, I, let I wouldn't me. say that. I wouldn't say I'm I, I, I passionately watch your channel. I'm actually thrilled to be here today. It's fantastic, and I, all those topics. But what I'm trying to do is, is uh, keep that well clear from presenting their work because yeah. it's, it's hard enough already. Mm -hmm. There's already enough trouble, if you like, just getting this alternative yeah. look at history across. Mm -hmm. The last thing you need is yeah. more throwing in more or, or getting labeled, you know, or, yeah. you know, you are the kind of things that, you know, you, you have yeah. to go through. It's a different, I mean, what you do is amazing. And it, it's, it's a different field. Because it's, even yeah. in the, mm -hmm group, let's say, that follow Wilson and Black, it's, mm -hmm. there's splinter groups and arguments, isn't there? Well, it's, it's, hopefully, it's, it's yeah. Politics and, but some of it has been nasty. No? Yeah, well, yeah, I suppose so. But I, I, again, I like to dwell on that because they're, hopefully that's all in the past. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I think people were trying maybe to, I don't know what they're trying to do, monopolise their work or, or um, shut it down or whatever. I don't know. I don't really know. I mean, I'd like to just put all that behind yeah. us. Yeah. And we have a much more open discussion. And I don't, yeah. I wouldn't like it if everyone had the same views on all of it. And what we're trying to do at the moment is get their work more widely available and really research it. You know, mm -hmm. when we're republishing books, they've got more um, references and all the criticisms that have been leveled in the past, mm -hmm. addressing and hopefully the work can get explored and become a legitimate, yes. mature subject. So you went to see Alan Wilson. I'm just taking a bit of video because people keep asking me how you are. Oh, I see. Well, I'm surviving. Surviving? Well, who keeps asking? Well, f fans of your TV shows. I didn't know anything. <laughs> um, about the fact that he explains how to interpret hieroglyphs and you ended up writing your own book based on that section of their work. Correct, yes. So just tell us about that book, Ross. Oh, well, that's, well I came up with this word, cumroglyphics, which mm -hmm. seems to have caught on. Mm -hmm. And the book's done really well, and it's even been published in America as well now. And mm -hmm. it's fully attributed to Wilson and Blackett. Because another thing, I, 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 I'm very keen on correct attributions. And you've seen some books in that have pretty much gleaned their work. And I wonder if some people are just waiting for him to die. I know it sounds horrible, but Alan's now 90. Yeah. And then he can just walk off. I don't know. Anyway, let's not get into that side. But the, the Cameroglyphics book is it's just so wonderful how it works. It, it's very hard to dispute if you can get people to look at it. Mm -hmm. And we can go through some examples maybe a little bit later. But it's, it's so fundamental. And what it opens up then, the questions, is how can we possibly have this link whereby the language Cameraig or Welsh can be used back in the Middle East? Because then... This feeds in to the whole migrations. This is why everything is interlinked. Mm -hmm. as, as, um, as Wilson and Black had explained, they did not set out to translate hieroglyphs. That was never their intention. What they, have, what they did do was look at the ancient British historical records, look at the old uh, British writing system, which is much ridiculed, Colburn, mm -hmm. and the old Welsh writing. And then you can trace that back to Italy, and you can read Etruscan. You can go back to um, Anatolia, and there's Phrygian. All these languages break down, and then when they follow in the British history, say we go back to the Middle East and Egypt, and you've got the whole thing about the lost tribes and all these kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, if they do, let's see if we can read the hieroglyphs. And it just dropped out. It didn't take them 20 years to crack it. Mm -hmm. It took them like half an hour because... Right. Well, we're going to yes. look at some examples of that in a second, Ross. Okay. But just so, so your collaboration with them then, you, you decided to get their books republished because some of them were out of print, yeah? Yeah, I, I don't know what's happened to them all. I don't, I don't know, I don't get this conspiracy world or whatever, but um, 
where do they all go? You know, we got mm. the got the original hardbacks which mm. he was selling. You know, the um, yeah. uh, you know the big black books as we call them, the BBBs. Mm -hmm. But things like Moses and the Hieroglyphs, where where we're all the copies, King Arthur conspiracy, the Trojan War, all this stuff they did into ancient history. Mm -hmm. None of it was available, right. so I was like, well, let's make it available. Yeah, I mean, when I lost touch with them, when I moved to Wales, it wasn't practical for me to keep going, yeah, getting yeah, the yeah. books from their cellar and bring them, bring them back to where yeah, I Yeah, I know was. that feeling, yes. Um, <laughs> but you, you, can, you, you started doing that yourself, yes. uh, um, getting books from their archive and, and putting yes. them on your own website for sale. Um, so do you want to just go through the books that, that are available uh, still available now, and the ones that you've had reprinted. Yeah, okay. And one thing I'd like to say on this as well is that um, one of the things I really want to emphasise is that all the work I'm doing and the revenue you're raising and everything is shared with Wilson and Blackett. Mm. I mean, they they need help in mm. their old age, if you like. They, mm. they, you know, this is all part of the practical help for it. So all the, the books, like the ones you see here, like these are the, oh, the three ones they did first. Uh, we, yep. all these I bought all these cash up front, mm -hmm. and then we resell them on. You know, obviously make a bit of a market, but that's the. So we got this is one Arthur and the Charts of the Kings, and we got Arthur King of Glamorgan and Gwent, and this is their sort of uh, novelisation of a lot of the events. Arthur the Walking, where you can follow the campaigns, the famous battles up to Scotland, um, going back a couple of generations to set the scene as well. Uh, this. These are big books. I mean, this is the thing. These are, and there's only so many of these left, and I'm not sure these will ever be reprinted. Right. Yeah. They were printed, these are the ones it, you sold. Yeah. Yes. These are printed back in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. And and they all um, claim that Arthur was a, a sixth century king, uh, with with possibly a, a previous Ar Arthur uh, about 300 years earlier. So they they talk of two Arthurs. Yes. 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 But the main Arthur is the sixth century king who fought in Europe. I think. And is is the the legendary King Arthur of of the you know the yeah yeah well, the King both, Arthur legend yes, yes, this yes. is this is who he really was he was the King of Glamorgan and Gwent Correct. and that's that's what the Arthurian side of Wilson Blackett's work um, supports or, or seeks to prove hmm. yeah. yes Arthur at Myrig son of Myrig and Tudrig so in here what they've done is they piece together the whole genealogy of the the, the High Kings the Welsh royal family. So you can see this, his father was Myrig, grandfather Tudrig, Tythefelt, you can go all the way back. That's, as you correctly say, there's two Arthurs. And what seems to have happened, and this would have been done by um, Griffith Ap Arthur, or Geoffrey of Monmouth, as he's more commonly referred to, he's one of the pieces of work I've, I've put together at the moment. There's so much to publish still from there. I, I mean, given their notes and work, and there's tons, mm -hmm. getting it all together on this vast range of subjects. One of the fascinating things they've done there is pieced together uh, these genealogies and unpicked. What happened with Griffith Ap Arthur or Geoffrey of Monmouth is it seems he's, he's collected this huge pile of manuscripts and earlier history. And you can imagine it arriving like that, you know, well, not exactly like that, but all different bits and some it's a bit broken up and different styles. And he's tried to collate it all to make a consistent narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, what, if you go on a mainstream history site, people say, oh, it's just pseudo-history, it's nonsense, he's invented it. Where the genius of Alan Wilson, he's looked at it and said, well, actually, all these things do check out. Just the overall story is obviously incorrect. Like, if there was only one Arthur, how could he fight the Romans at the end of the 4th century and fight the Saxons in the 6th century? He'd have to be 200 years old. Mm -hmm. Once you start unpicking it, and this is, this is the fascinating thing, which is I love the work so much, most historians will say, well, this is a load of rubbish. What they'll do is, uh, Wilson and Black will do is take it all apart, and then the amazing thing is then put it back together in the correct order, yes. and suddenly it all makes sense. And mm -hmm. this is the wonderful thing about it. And this goes through the next days of the work they've done is, is going through all the old uh, British kings, like, we call them, like, the, like the ones even Shakespeare wrote about, like Lear and people like that. And uh, there's a big discussion these days about Malmudian law and who Malmud was and when he was. Mm -hmm. Well, with the work that's coming out, you can then place him correctly in history. And people can have a shock because what's happened, similar to with the Egyptology, Egyptian history, in some cases we have parallel dynasties. Mm -hmm. And the collator, medieval or wherever, modern, has, has put them this way. Right. 
So actually, you've got a thousand years of history, which should only be a couple of hundred years of history. I see. So someone like Malmud, for example, he could be 400 AD rather than 400 BC. It makes that kind of difference, big differences. Okay. So when all that, so what they're doing is putting back together the whole structure. And the reason why Arthur is important is because everything would have disappeared. All of it would have just got pushed out of history and forgotten. But Arthur, such a strong narrative that went you know, over to France and then back again, you can't hide it, and that's why it stands out. Okay. So it's, it's not just about Arthur, but he's the sort of famous name, the shining light, the star of the show, if you like. All right, now, um, <clears throat> after they published these three books, <clears throat> the next book was um, Artorius Rex Discovered. Yep. Uh, because they, they did an archeological dig at the location where they believe Arthur yes. is buried, and they found uh, the famous stone with uh, Rex Artorius carved in it mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and that book um, speaks about that Artorius um, Rex yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can get that from Ross's website yeah we've got some of these left again yeah there's not many left I believe no no this one you might be able to republish these would be they would never be republished like this as big right. hardbacks right. and again so, so if you run out of that one you you might republish it yes right okay yes so it might need some revision what I want to say for all these books there's a combination of reprints and republishing mm -hmm. It's an incredibly light editorial touch because it's, it's just a tricky balance mm -hmm. because the magic of their writing, which people enjoy so much, is that pugnacious, mm -hmm. hard-hitting style which doesn't yeah. help you win academic yeah. friends. Yeah, we are a bit pissed off about all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. comes across. Well, it's, like, the... it's like they call like, um, academics gathering like a bovine herd and all this kind of stuff, you know. It's, but, oh, we could come on to that, but they're... But you've got to keep that kind of flavour into it. What you can't do, in my view, when editing, is remove any of the findings or historical stuff. What you do find in some of the books, I think those who've read them will realise, you do get a bit of meandering and... Repetition, maybe. Repetition, yeah. You know, whole chunks get repeated. And I'm just a slight aside why that happens. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story to show you the mind of this person, Alec Wilson. There was a period where he had cataracts. And he couldn't, he could hardly see at all. He was practically blind while he waited for the operations. So Baron Blackett would read, you know, like all these ancient historical books, Tacitus and all these records and all that. He would read them to him. Alan would take it all in because he can't see it or write or make notes. Mm -hmm. Then when it came to writing the book, they'd say, right, let's do the next chapter. And Alan would just say it. Right. And Tony would record it. And then it would take him a couple of weeks to type it up. Mm -hmm. And then you get the next chapter. So what you, one of the reasons you get the repetition is almost if you were doing a course at university and it's a 10 lecture course. So if you, chapter five, lecture five, you'd say, well, if you remember what we said in lecture one, we covered blah, 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 blah. In a book, you don't need to do that. Yeah. But if you're doing it verbally like he was, there's going to be recaps. And what, what gives a, 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 a nice note of authenticity is when you do get these repetitions, they, they always correlate, you know, they don't right. suddenly get a different version in different chapters. Right. So, okay. so taking some of that out to make the books flow better, and then adding indexes and references, that kind right. of stuff. So do you want to show us some of the books that you've had yes. <laughs> reprinted? Yeah, well, here's, um, here's an, this is just a straight reprint. This is Moses in the Hieroglyphs. So I would love to go through and do um, a full, like, second edition, as you'll see with uh, Trojan War in a second. Uh, so this, I mean, you can see the size of it. This is just vast. So just on the front cover here, just to point out that um, Ross is a, a, a cartoon artist and, yep. <laughs> and he's actually drawn uh, caricatures of Wilson Blackett on the front of, it, of yeah. the republished books. Yeah. Uh, and you did one of me as well. <laughs> I did, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, if I actually got that somewhere, yeah. yeah. All right. But, there's, but the, yeah, there's no copyright issues on these books because I've redrawn all the illustrations and maps right. and everything that needs drawing. So M Moses and the Hieroglyphs, what does that cover? Because this book just fascinated me because it's... Um, they wanted to explore this history and what's in the hieroglyphs and everything. So it's almost as an aside. Mm -hmm. so the first thing we had to do is like work out how to read hieroglyphs. So we all sat down and, well, that's how you read hieroglyphs. It, it's yeah. almost discarded in this book, whereas when I was reading it, yeah. wow, that's an amazing discovery. So what it, this covers so much. It's got um, where Alexander the Great was buried. and all this. The, the reason why it's called Moses in the hieroglyphs is what they've revealed is you can indeed find the Old Testament biblical characters in the hieroglyphs and you can find the stories. There's a lot of interest in this book. So for example, who the Queen of Sheba was, why she had to travel. You know, she was an Egyptian heiress and there was no 
males with the right godlike royal level mm -hmm. to have children with. So this is why she had to go and see Solomon, and this is the journey and what it was about, and she had to take the gifts with her and the gifts that came back and the boats, the voyage. It all makes sense, and mm -hmm. so much of it in there. And then um, so what they've also done is translate loads and loads of passages from hieroglyphs. Right, so these are Egyptian hieroglyphs, yes. right, in Egypt, yes. right, that academics don't know what they mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Beyond, Wilson and yeah. Blackett have taken them and said, well, actually, what they're saying is this. Yes. And you've written your own book specifically about interpreting the hieroglyphs, right? We'll, co we'll come on yeah, to that yeah, 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 yes, we'll yes, do some examples. Yes. So do you want to go through some of the other books yeah, you've, yeah, had, so you've had reprinted? Okay, um, well, yeah, people so can read about them on your website. Yes. Um, so, well, in many ways you say, I, I'm, um, I'm more interested in how you read the hieroglyphs than what they say. <laughs> right. That sounds a bit crazy. But anyone could pick it up. Because just to finish on this one is where it does go through then is... Um, who uh, it, because what's important for... Uh, where this ties in with the British history is people like uh, Joseph or Joseph turn up in the stories, as does Moses, and you can follow the story, and you can work out who the Hyksos were. They're not these shepherds wandering down from the hills as we're generally presented to us. Mm -hmm. This was a royal dynasty. This was a powerful nation. Mm -hmm. And they've come in and they've, uh, they've run Egypt. And once, you, once your eyes are opened, you can read it in the Bible. The Bible confirms all this. It's just how you read it. So just, just one question, yeah. Ross, about Moses and the hieroglyphs. If Moses is in the hieroglyphs, does that mean that the Bible just copied it from the hieroglyphs and Moses didn't really exist at that time? He was actually much earlier in, uh, uh, and was an Egyptian character, or, or, or what? What does that mean, mm -hmm. that Moses was in the hieroglyphs? Well, it gives the whole story of him, in there. Well, well, it's a good question, actually, because the... Um, the amazing thing about it, the place where you can actually see his name as um, he of the basket. One of the things you have to remember, with, with someone like a character like Moses, he's got does a load of names, right? At least mm. ten. So the, um, the mother has got a name, something like, you know, a gift from God. The father's like the one who returned because he went and came back. The Egyptians call him he of the basket because the whole story with him in the basket in the Nile and the Egyptian princess finding him. So in there you can follow the whole story uh, of Moses, which is why it's the way it gets the irony is that uh, one of the great messages in here is that at the end of his life, when they come to the promised land after they've left mm -hmm. uh, Egypt, he in the Bible story, this time the story just ends. So this, we're left with the impression that this lonely old man just I don't know what he do, just die on a hill or something, or just dig himself a grave because he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. If you remember, mm -hmm. uh, Joshua has to take them in was what Wilson Blackett showed, he actually returned to Egypt. And this makes sense of the, there's a scene, a lot of this has to come from the Torah rather than the Bible, which ties in with the hieroglyphs as well. But there's a scene in there where, it's a bizarre scene where uh, a young girl is put in his tent for the night. Uh, and why has he done that? Well, because the reason for that would be to, to see if he's, to prove he's still not able to produce heirs, to put it crudely. Right. Okay. And so he was then able to return to Egypt and he has a, a burial uh, mastaba in Egypt. Now, the classical archaeologists are called this Ptah Shepsis, and it's actually in the British Museum. So the, the thing which actually tells you the story of Moses, mm -hmm. and you can see his name, is in the British Museum, and the British Museum doesn't know. Right. <laughs> and they okay. call it the false story of Ptah Shepsis. Right. So what year are we talking? Is it, what, 1500 BC? Yeah, about that, 1500 BC, yeah. Right. Although chronology is another thing. I mean, I think yeah. always chronology is maybe suspect, but right. that's so, another issue. So it's yeah. quite possible that the Moses story it is recorded in, in Egyptian hieroglyphs yes. because, it, it, you know, they were writing those hieroglyphs 1500 BC. Yeah, yeah so well, that's, well, the accusation is... It's not being is, borrowed yeah. from an earlier time, you, I, I, I mean. Well, I, I, I mean, that's a whole different subject. But right. if you're going with the conventional chronology of things... Right. There's a lot of discussion when this book was written, and it still goes on today, that um, they're trying to show that there, was no, there were no Old Testament characters. It's all just made up. Because if there were, why is there no mention of them in the hieroglyphs? It's yes. like, well, if there is, and they were a dynasty that actually ran the show. The other thing he points out here is that Egypt was a part of a larger empire. This is the key point. So the big emperor they're talking about, the pharaoh, which interestingly is, is a Welsh word. If you look in the old dictionary, you see pharaoh means high powers, mm -hmm. rather than a particular job title, as it were. The emperor would not have been there all the time. And as always happens, you'd know more about this than I do, but there's always a preference to have a foreign body run the country. It makes you less susceptible to 
I guess the country being taken over or something. Like the Pope has a Swiss guard and the French kings have escorts, you know, they have the German, uh, Scottish regiment. This kind of thing's always gone on. Mm -hmm. So the Hyksos, this is where the story of the Bible, where Joseph gets put in charge. He's a viceroy. He's running the country for the absentee emperor. Right. Yeah. And it's part of a bigger emperor. And the whole thing, this, is, this, is, this other thing this book reveals, is the whole history of the Middle East is completely different to how we're presented. Right. It, the big thing was the Hittites and the Chaldeans and all this, these huge wars that were going on back and forth across that whole area, right up to Anatolia and east. The problem is, in the west, we discovered Egypt first with the old um, academics and that, and the pyramids are so impressive and the hieroglyphs. And you just think, wow, this place is amazing. This is the centre of everything in the Middle East or Near East. Actually, no, that's a little sideshow. Hmm. You can see the earlier... It's actually the, the invasion that took place. Egypt was invaded, and this is why it's not, not a very popular message to the Egyptians either, because you're talking about uh, an occupying country doing this. Right. So, so I'll give you an analogy. Say in 500 years' time, an archaeologist went to India. They would look around. They'd see statues of Queen Victoria. They'd see English writing on all the statues, yeah. and they would assume English is the language and Victoria was the queen. What they wouldn't realize is, no, that wasn't actually the language of the common people. Yeah. The language has been adopted by the academic level and the scribes and the Indian civil service still runs on English. But actually, how would an archaeologist think, well, actually, it was some little island, wherever it is, 10,000 miles away that did all this. Yeah. It would, yeah. It would an amazing uh, leap of imagination to come to that conclusion. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. So, all right. And of course, the language is crucial because if you can't, do the language, you can't read them. Anyway, yeah, yeah, so Trojan War sort of builds on that one, really. So we're really into ancient history, and this is looking at the... Yeah, the, a number of people yeah. have requested that book um, of myself when I ran out I ran out of their original copies, so it's good that you've had them reprinted because <laughs> they're not available now. Well, they, well, they are now. You've, you've yes, had them. yes. Is that re reprinted word for word? Right, well, this is, a, this is called this a second edition. Right. Because what we've done here, with I've got to say, uh, people like Patricia Gilcash and Marshall Abrahams. I got so many volunteers. I don't think that was just me doing all this. It would be mm. impossible. How Wilson and Blackett did it, I have no idea. Mm. Cause, but, but this is what we've done here. This has had some light editing. Right. So some of the repetitions been removed. Try to get things in a more um, logical order, if just you like. Just hold that up to the camera, yeah. Ross, yeah, so we can see. Yeah, I, I love the caricatures. They're, they're, oh, thank you. So yeah. Accurate, yeah. Oh, you like yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the title is interesting of that book yes. because it's so Alan Wilson because the most controversial thing about that book is the dating of that war, isn't it? Because yes. other historians will say there's no way that the Trojan War occurred at 650 BC. Mm. That, that, that's, the, that's the contentious thing that that book is saying, and he puts it right on the cover. Yes, and says, yes. the Trojan War yeah. of 650 BC. Yeah, 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 no disputing it. Yeah, that's very <laughs> Alan's style. <laughs> yeah, these points are up for discussion with Alan, as far as Alan's concerned. But you're right, I mean, even more critically, the main, the main, the, the consensual history, let's call it that, is that the Trojan War didn't happen at all. Because mm. the difficulty you have, you see, is that if you look at, this is where it comes back to Britain's hidden history, is why it's so important. The British history claims that they're, I'm not just talking about the Welsh now, I'm talking about the English and that, are descendants of Troy. So London used to be called Troy Novantis, New Troy. Mm. So this is, is, is this through Brutus? Yes, that's right, yes, yeah, 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 through the Brutus Migration. Yeah, you've got it, yes. Yeah. So you've got the, the Roman records talk about it as well. It's weird. We've got this fa fascination with everything written by Romans is sacrosanct, apart from this, which is all just myths and legends and nonsense. So after Troy, you've got um, Enid, then you come to the, the, the journey, Virgil's writings. So anyway, you come down a few generations later, you've got Brutus. So what they've done, they've become the Etruscans. So they're in um, Etruria, sort of north of Italy. And at some point then, by prophecy, and whether or not prophecies are written before or after the events, Brutus is prophesied to kill both his parents. So his mother dies in childbirth. There's some sort of hunting accident. He accidentally kills his father. He has to leave uh, Italy. And what he does, he goes back. This is the narrative you get from British history and from the Roman history. He goes back to Anatolia with the other half of the people. So what do you have? You've got this people migrating up from the biblical lands, if you go to the end of the Bible, it talks about them going up north. So they end up in modern-day Turkey, Anatolia. So half have gone and become Etruscans. Brutus has either called them or gone to collect them. The other half, uh, you, could, you, you could put my little cartoons up there, because I'm going to go talking to them, saying, uh, 
we go into a land which is green and fertile, and the mm -hmm. two uh, Etruscans are sniggering to each other uh, uh, from Turkey. Does that mean it's always raining? You know, this is the. So he's yep. convinced them. This is the key part then of British history. I would say it's the most important part because the migration we have then is to come through the Mediterranean and up into Britain, and that's how the Cymru and mainly other, Western Britain, would you say, an island? Well, or, or, that would be, except London's called New Troy, and right, that's in the oh, southeast, oh, isn't okay, it? So, right, I mean, right. this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because you've got the earlier Albine migrations going back to 1400 BC, and they're also part of this. And this is where you get Albanatus for Alban for Scotland, Loicris for, uh, for, London, uh, for England, Loigris, mm -hmm. and, and um, Cambria for Wales. And uh, what year is Brutus? Is that 500? Well, that's about 500 BC. Yeah, that's yeah, right. 500 yeah, yeah. BC. Yeah. Okay. So, so the idea is, if there's no... Troy, mm. then all of British history is a myth, you see. This mm. is why it's so important. If you can show you there is a Troy, and then you've got, Alan Wilson always quotes the fact that Schliemann, you know, in the 18, wherever it was, 1880s, 1890s, discovered what he called Troy. But of course, that's controversial as well. Is that Troy? And that's rubbish. One of the reasons I think it's so attacked is because it supports British history. Right. And then you get some fascinating questions. If it was fate, British history, in medieval times or something, how on earth did they know about things they reference in Anatolia? And why is it we've got in Turkey this place is called Gumri and is Crimea a, a, a corruption of the word Cymru? And the Greeks talk about the Kimeroi coming through. This, this, is, this, so this is all explored in this. This is not just about the Trojan War. Right. In fact, I it's a couple of years since I did this one, I think it's about page 300 before you actually get to the Trojan War. Right. <laughs> in typical Wilson yeah. and Blackett fashion. Yeah. The kind of all the things I've just summarised very briefly, I've gone through in great detail why it's important, right. the British record. So the, the yeah. Brutus line from 500 BC, <coughs> does that link to the Arthurian line of, what, the 6th century yeah. well, this a is, AD? Yes, yeah. so well this is the argument, how far can you go back and trace it? So this is where they haven't shown their family tree all the way back to Brutus, right. but I think they've done enough research to do that. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff I need to get together to try and make those links. Funny, I've got asked the same question um, about a week ago. That's the kind of thing we're looking at, because I don't think they've actually published that direct link to Brutus, right. per se. It does go back quite a long way in the ancient British kings. Now, we've got people like in our group, like Marshall Abrahams, who's an author and is brilliant at this stuff, and, and she is uh, putting together a book at the moment talking about the migrations. And, of course, another uh, it's not just Wilson and Blackett in what we're doing. I mean, this is the, the bedrock and the cornerstone, if you But you, you've got, like, Eamon Wilkins talking about... Uh, did the Trojan War happen in uh, Britain? This mm -hmm. is a, it's a, it's a very interesting theory. And that ties in with a lot of ancient British history and the first migration. And that war seems though like it could have taken place about 1100 BC. Right. So again, we've got another situation where a couple of stories have been conflated. Because what Wilson Blackett show is the character, again, uh, the Trojan War is best thought of a little bit like D-Day. For us, it's the biggest thing in World War II. Right. This is the main centre of everything. But actually, if you look at the numbers, there's about two divisions of Germans on the Western Front and, I don't know, 80, 90 divisions fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front. Right. And it's a similar thing here. And it explains why so many people have come from different areas because empires are clashing mm -hmm. and bringing people in. So the whole narrative, the Trojan War, changes and makes more sense. And the other revelation then is how much the Egyptian connections come in and why the hieroglyphs are important. Because you can see that Agamemnon um, <clears throat> was actually, you know, Ramesses the first, and you know you can go through all the Trojan War characters and see that they're based in Greece. And if you look at um, things like not so much the Iliad, but if you look at the Odyssey, you can see in there it actually mentions and going back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. it's, why has no one picked up on this? Right. It's one of these things that once you Wilson Black had pointed the things out to you. Yeah. You look at Homer, or you look at the Bible, look at these books, you think, yeah, it does say that. Why have I never noticed that? Right. Any more bu books that you've had republished? Yeah, yeah. so that's the Trojan War. Yeah, I just want to say on this one, what we did on there was resource it all out. And then with Patricia Gilcash, a brilliant job. We've got an index now. You've got references and appendixes and all that, and it should flow better as a read. Mm -hmm. There's this book which I don't like to talk about. This is more your area. This is, yeah. This yeah. is all about... So this is all about the, um, <clears throat> the bomb that was put under Baron Blackett's bed by uh, somebody... Well, we don't know who did it. Um, it nearly killed him. He was in a coma for eleven days. His health's still bad. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can watch this. 
you can watch that story from previous Rich Planet episodes. Yes. It's, it's not really a history book, this one. No. Um, no. Uh, any others, Ross? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this so is the King Arthur conspiracy, this is one of Alan's. This, Alan, a huge this one, yeah. was a later, what, 1990s? So I think it's 2005, I think. Right, 2005. So that's after the Holy Kingdom. So <coughs> in between all this, mm. we've got the Holy Kingdom, which you haven't had reprinted because that's Adrian Gilbert's at all. Yes, yeah, another, it, another publisher. It's yeah. another publisher. Um, so the King Arthur Conspiracy, you've split that book into two books, uh, and they're both available on, on your website. Yes, now. that's right, yeah. I'd like to make them you know, available for your website as well. We'll, we'll get right. that going on there. Because what we have is, um, it's such a vast book. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 so, if someone's interested in King Arthur and, and th th this work, uh, I usually point them to the Holy Kingdom, because mm -hmm. that's considered the most easy to read and all-encompassing um, it doesn't have any of the vitriol that these books <laughs> have in it. No. Um, wh I mean, what would you recommend? Because people might be sitting watch, watching this thinking, well, which, I want to buy it. I'd yeah. like to read one, but yeah, I don't know which yeah, yeah. one to read. I agree with you. It's, 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 it's such a vast thing. I mean, we've gone just in the last 10 minutes of talking from ancient Egypt and mm. the Trojan War and journeys around the world all the way up to 6th, 7th century. Because what this book focuses on is the, 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 the alleged or claimed migration of the Welsh to North America mm -hmm. in the 6th century, yeah. almost a thousand years before Columbus. Yeah. That's what this is. So I'm splitting the two, it's so vast. So this yeah. part... And just to interject, Ross, yeah. there's, yeah, there's evidence in places like uh, Kentucky. Yep, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Well, Lee Pennington's done great work over yeah. there, yes, yes. Of, of artifacts that look like they've come from Wales. Yes, yeah. yes. It, it, at what age? What, what year? Yeah, well, we're talking about sixth century. Sixth century, so the sixth century uh, exploration from from Wales yes. to America. Yes. That, that's what it's arguing. Yeah, in the Welsh accounts, if you look at them, um, even the Mabinogi describes it, if you know how to read these things, is, is that they started off uh, when the comet came. This is the biggest event in British history, which is never talked about. So the comet, around about 562, Mm -hmm. is, uh, we could talk all week yeah, about and that. And there's physical evidence of that, isn't well, yeah, there? Well, yeah, like Vitry I mean, Five Forts and yes, this yeah. kind so, of thing. Yeah. You know, we're not, this isn't this legend or anything. There's physical evidence of, the, yes. uh, of some huge cataclysm which put Britain into darkness for 11 years. Yeah, it years. shattered the country. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, right. But yeah. carry on. Yeah, so th this is... Um, so as part of that story, then, you have uh, Madoc Morvran, which is the cormorant. It's just sort of a, a nickname, if you like. Uh, now, whether or not he went deliberately to find new lands or he was driven off course during that period, he's ended up in North America. And after uh, so many years, eight, nine years, something like that, he's come back mm -hmm. and say, guess what, found this new land. So then uh, Quairon, I think his name is, the other admiral goes back with him to check the story out, see if they can get there. Yes, they can. So the idea is then that they took, I think it's a thousand ships, with about 70 per ship. So you're talking a large migration, like 70,000 people, uh, set sail from Milford Haven. And what you find on the American side of things, it's like uh, Jim Michaels before he sadly passed away, Lee Pennington, there's the Archaeological Society, Old Kent, uh, Kentucky. Yeah, so just to yeah. check, these are American researchers yes. uh, who, who've been d unearthing artifacts yeah, 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 yeah. that appear that they originate in, in Wales. Yeah, Yeah. well, there's certain things so, which you wouldn't expect to see. So, yeah. for example, you've got woven goods like cotton, which they didn't weave. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, certain metal production which is not, but most critically, which comes in this book again, it's again, it's the writing. Mm -hmm. And there's writing on certain caves and mounds and things, or on stones, lots mm -hmm. of stones, engraved stones I I in America. And what Wilson and Black have done is show those stones can again be read using this ancient Welsh uh, writing system. Mm -hmm. I should call it a British system. I don't want to come across it's just a Welsh thing. It's not. The reason why it's the language is maintained in Wales and the records are maintained. What's left of them have been obliterated. Mm. That's why Wales comes up so often. But like for example, when we're looking at um, Arthur the First, you mentioned the two Arthurs, you know, he's in Warwickshire. The campaigns of Arthur II, they're in Scotland. Mm. King Lear was in Leicestershire. You know, Elmet was in the north of England. It's not just about Wales, just that's where the records ended up because the rest got flattened. And this led to the invasion or arrival because Alan, as Alan Wilson always says, if you had a calamity, in those days, people didn't send help. They sent armies, you know. Right. The yeah. country's devastated, yeah. and they come in. And, and also, the, even the, um, the Anglo-Saxon brutes talk of wandering tribes, you know. Everyone's 
is traumatized and shattered. This is after it? the comet. Yeah, nothing's growing, you know, there's yeah. some sort of uh, contamination of the lands. So they've walked in. This mm. is why archaeologists aren't finding any evidence of, of uh, conflict, mm. because th that part had been wiped out, really. All right. So it's a massive tragedy in British history. So any other books that have been republished, uh, uh, Ross? Well this, 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 well, this is a new one, then. This is, uh, here's one, which is... Um, Again, go. again, just for the title. So the, Alan's written this, yeah? I, 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 I came up with the title. I know oh, you're right, not, you did, you're not a fan you? of this title, are no, you? No, I'm not a fan of this title. The <laughs> thing is, that's not, gonna I, that's not gonna show up well against the green screen. Let me oh, just, no, it's not. Yeah, it's we, an we, invisible we, book, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the invisible book where Jesus is buried. Yeah, you okay. can see through me now. now. I've got an invisible chest. Let's, let's just... Um, I, 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 the original title I had for it was Britain's Hidden Christianity, which I think would have been, I should have right. stuck with it. Let's, I thought this would be sensational. There's loads of books. Well, but it, let me just say a few <laughs> things about, about, about that claim first. Yes. Because, um, yes. you know, I don't want to tarnish all the Arthurian work and, 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 and this yes. work about the Middle East with a, with a possibly uh, untrue claim. Now, yes. I'm not saying it's not I true, mean, right? Yes. Um, but, with, <clears throat> but I think as you go further back in time, let's say from the Arthurian time, I think the, the evidence gets, gets more sparse, let's say. Um, so, I mean, I know that there are researchers uh, other than Wilson and Blackett who say that Joseph of Arimathea, who was Jesus's, uh, well, uh, I think Mary's uncle or great uncle, right, a, a relative of Jesus, yeah, a relative anyway, uh, who, who looked after his body after he came down off the cross, right, and he came to Britain. So this, it's not just Wilson and Blackett who claim that. Like I've heard Adrian Gilbert say it, and I've heard yes. uh, I've heard other researchers say that that. Joseph of Arimathea, who was spreading Christianity, uh, c came to Britain, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm prepared to entertain that. Uh, yeah. Now, so th th the theory that Jesus survived the crucifixion and then came to Britain, right, uh, is a stretch for some people. And you, you look at, there are academics who've looked at the history of Jesus in great detail, looking at records, who will say there wasn't a person called Jesus. So the you know, he was made up in order to write the Bible or, or to control people. He, he was this figure that they've, or they've, or they've moved him from so many years earlier, much mm -hmm. in, in the distant past, that, uh, because there are characters that are, have Jesus as attributes in, in, in ancient Egypt, and perhaps they've just brought him forward and just renamed him for the purposes of their, of their holy book, right? Yep. No, I'm not saying that's true. No, no, I can explain right? I know that there yeah. are academics who yes. will contend that Jesus was not a real person in the way that he's described or named in the Bible, right? Mm. Uh, uh, now, in, in, in this book, uh, Wilson Blackett is saying that he's buried in, in West Wales, is that right? And, Correct, they, and yes. they use place names and things like yes. that, <coughs> and they've written this book. So uh, I'm not selling that book on my website. Yeah, I, know, I, yes. I haven't read it, I haven't read it, so perhaps okay. I shouldn't pass judgment, right? Um, but it, in terms of... You well, know, I, I, I so so, so points, yes. over to you, Ross. Yeah, okay, all right, let's go through... All those things, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's been twisted and matched up and the pieces need taken apart and put them back together in the right order again, okay? So all those things you say all, all apply, but mm -hmm. not in the way you might think. Mm -hmm. the, the first thing you have to be aware of, right, the, the, story, the first thing is that they, they do identify the historical Jesus, okay? This is the important thing here. Mm -hmm. So this family tree, and the key thing is who he was is crucial. He's not some peasant whose dad was a carpenter, and he is married as well. It would be mentioned in the Bible if he wasn't married as well. There's no way, if he's some sort of rabbi, he could be unmarried throughout his whole adult life. He'd be known as Jesus the unmarried one, you know, or mm -hmm. something like that. So what you can do is, what Wilson Black had done here is trace who his wife was, right. and her ancestry is crucial, because her ancestry goes back then. Her father, uh, the king of Juba, the third, I think, and the mother is, would have been Cleopatra the Eighth. She's the daughter, she's a product of the union between Mark Antony and Cleopatra, Cleopatra the Seventh, I think. So, they're the descent. Jesus, what, what this book also describes is who the Hasmonians are, who the Edomians are, goes through all the different uh, sources, um, uh, the, the Jewish sources, Talmud, all this kind of thing, and work out what you had, in the political situation in is, uh, it, what you call Israel today, or the Bible lands, is, is crucial. And that's what's not taken into account when people do the analysis. 
So you've got the, the family which Herod is a descendant of, the famous Herod. His dealings with the Romans are going on. He's Imodian. I'm going to say that slightly wrong. Edomian. There's the names get a bit confusing. And his claim on the throne is tenuous because the real dynasty, the real descendants, mm -hmm. that comes down to Jesus. Now, if you bear in mind then that he's also got the, the lost tribe connections with Britain. So what you have is a situation, if these claims are correct, where uh, we've got the claim to the, be the descendant of Israelites, you know, from David and, and uh, Solomon, these kind of things, the original uh, holy family, and potentially their claim, whatever the claims Jesus has got. But his wife gives claims then to uh, Egypt, mm -hmm. and also with Mark Antony as an ancestor, you've got a direct claim to the whole Roman Empire, whatever that is, which I don't think there's a Roman Empire as such as we're described. That's another issue. I think it's more to do with Etruscans. But anyway, mm -hmm. using the framework everyone's familiar with, you're, you're playing for all the marbles. Here you've got a descendant. Their child, the Abelach, as he's been termed, is potentially a descendant for all the major uh, kingdoms or empires or powers in the Western Mediterranean. So it's a really high-stakes game. That's the first thing about this book. What, and it goes on to explain to justify that, show the family tree is, how that's arrived at, all those things. Then, which is really fascinating, uh, is the whole, using the Bible as the main source, so you can read this and read your Bible, you can see it's all there. Yeah. What seems to have happened is that uh, Joseph Arimathea comes in and a deal was done. A deal was struck with Romans. Pontius Pilate, people like this, it's been arranged. What's, what seems to have happened is the son, because if you remember in the Bible, they want to, they, they, there's this sort of mock situation, it seems to be a bit stage managed. Who do you want to release? Do you want the peaceful Jesus released, or do you want Bar Abbas released? If you remember that scene from the Bible. Well, Bar Abbas, from the Arabic, Bar, son of Abbas, is the master, so the son of the master. So the, what's put forward here is that uh, there's a deal is struck whereby they set Bar Abbas free. Mm -hmm. who's the son of Jesus. So the story goes that I, I would put in my slight addition to it is that there was, there, was, there was an armed conflict, which Josephus talks about. There's an armed uprising. This is what the turning over the tables of the money changes that refers to as the armed insurrection because they, the claim of the temple was the first thing you had to do. So these are people armed with swords and stuff. But there's a, unfortunately for them, there's a unit of regular soldiers near enough by to come and crush the rebellion. The son of Jesus seems to have been captured. <clears throat> and Jesus the son of Jesus? Yeah, the son, yeah, Barabbas. Okay. Barabbas, he's in the Bible, Barabbas. Right. Why wouldn't he have a son? Why wouldn't he be married? Yeah. <clears throat> Why is it so important for people as well? Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a normal thing for people to do. I say it'd be noted if he hadn't. <laughs> yeah. If he'd be the unmarried one, you know, it'd be yeah. very strange. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so a deal, so Judas, who's been cast throughout history as being the ultimate traitor, uh, probably a, a, a brother of Jesus, he's the one trusted to do the negotiations. And a deal is struck, whereby in return for the son, Barabbas, Jesus will hand himself over mm -hmm. to whether apparently be executed or really be executed. So that's the, se the scene in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, where Peter, as, is, um, as Alan says, there's a bit of a clot it comes across in the Bible, is that uh, a deal was done. So you have the scene where uh, when he comes up and Jesus gives the kiss, it's a signal that the deal's been put in place. And then is talking the Bible then of, of someone in a robe running across the field. Well, this would be the son of Jesus being released. So the Romans have fulfilled their side of the bargain. Jesus there's hands him in. We go th and he, all the trial is explained. This ridiculous bouncing from place to place, and how the justice is all rushed through. And then he's crucified on the eve of Passover. Now there can't be any executions in Passover. They have to be stopped at, at sundown. Now if the crucifixion. It could take days for someone to die. It's a horrible, very slow death. Unimaginable. <clears throat> yeah, unimaginable. But he, he's within a few hours. If you look at the Greek, because I don't know how Alan Wilson can, speak, can translate Greek as well anyway, but they talk about the body, uh, and they refer to it as a, a living body in the, in the Greek text of the Bible. And Pilate, if you remember, he's shocked. Like, what do you mean he's dead already? You know, he's only been up there a few hours. So this kind of shenanigans is going on, and they already yeah. had the grave prepared. You know, that was all waiting, all part of the deception. So the difficulty comes in then after the crucifixion, and it's in the Bible. It says in the Bible, he eats a meal. He's not a ghost. 
Right. Uh, Doubting Thomas. He said, where's the holes? Look, you know, this is me. and I'm hungry. I want a meal. Right. Well, if he's some sort of ghostly figure, why is he hungry? Why is he eating? <laughs> <coughs> so anyway, th 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 you follow the story on. What Wilson Black had brilliant at then is they then go to the political situation in Rome. And this is what's missed out by other researchers. Because what's happened up until then, you've had Tiberius living his crazy playboy lifestyle on his island, Capri. And in the meantime, you've got Sejanus has taken over. You know, if you look at the old, I highly recommend the old BBC I, Claudius right. series, where you can see a young uh, Patrick Stewart being Sejanus, you know, and he's, he's all heroes and hips and all that kind of stuff, and legs right. on tables. But he's taken over and he's doing a coup mm -hmm. of Rome. And this is happening during Sejanus' rule. And Herod is tied in with Sejanus. So what then happens is Tiberius gets tipped off what's going on. And then you have the retribution. Sejanus and his son are strangled and ugh, horrible things and he recaptures control, and suddenly the Watsits hit the fan, because what the heck's going on in the Middle East? What deal's going on here? How right. can this guy who's supposed to be executed still be walking around? Now, right. yeah, go on, sorry, I see you yeah. to jump in. Go yeah. on, yes, yeah. yes, yes, well, yes, yes. Well, OK, OK, um, so somehow he then ends up in Britain. Well, he has uh, to escape from that area, because if you look at a map, if you look at a map of the Mediterranean, it's all Roman territory. The only mm. bit not conquered at that point is Britain. Mm. And also, he's got his fellow people. If you follow the migrations from 500 BC, there's already like-minded people there. His own people are there. He might even be part of the royal family and have inheritance mm. claims. Because what they do show then is that with the holy family, family tree, mm. is they marry into the, the holy family. Mm. And Claudius seems to have been very impressed because he married one of his own daughters into the British family. Which is right. really weird if they're just a bunch of primitive tribesmen. And there are some Welsh <coughs> place names that they say are connected to Jesus. Uh, oh, the whole in, story, yeah, yeah. In, you, in, in that book. Well, one of the big things is Dewi. Who's Dewi? The patron saint of Wales, right? Mm. Well, the name is David, right? Well, what's the Welsh for David? It's David. Yeah. It's not Dewi. Yeah. Dewi means one with God. Right. David means David. Mm -hmm. David was the, the, the nutty monk from the 6th century who, you know, got the monks to pull the plough instead of the oxen and try to live on cabbage water and all that kind of stuff. He's David. Debbie's one with God. Right. Now, if you look, the National Day in Wales... So they're mixing up two characters, you think? No, I guess it's a complete swap. Right. Because the, the National Day in Wales, uh, Div Debbie Sant, or St. David's Day, is March the 1st, which uh, ties in then. If you look at the scenes of um, the birth, the nativity scenes, mm. you've got the shepherds with the young lambs and all this. It's a spring event. So March the 1st would seem to tie in with those dates. And the reason it got moved to December is because of the Saturnalian festival. And also you've got the winter solstice where the sun's at its lowest point. You know, the sun dies for three days. Yes, it comes yes. up, we all have a celebration. And then you've got those weird few days till the new year starts. Yeah. Well, it's been moved. The original, mm -hmm. the, the claim would be, the original uh, birth, if you like, or the, the, the holy day, the holy day for Christianity is March the 1st, mm -hmm. and it's Dewi, and it's still celebrated in Wales. Yeah. And another weird thing to add on that is if you look at the daffodil, yeah. <clears throat> the national flower of Wales, if you join this, they've got six points and you join them together, it's, uh, it's the Star of David. Mm. And you've even got the, the sun in the middle, so you've got the sun in the middle of the Star of David, and that blooms in the spring. Mm. So everything ties in that. Like I said, it's with names, then you've got the place names named after Dewi, and the whole story, and you can track down, this is why where Jesus is buried. I, I, maybe I shouldn't have gone with that title. I think Britain's Hidden Christianity might be better. I don't know. I thought this would get more attention. Yeah. But you can see it's a very well researched. Oh, yeah. I want to get back to. Sorry. I'm a, I, yes. Is, so, so <coughs> ju just. So, this is, this is a book. Sorry. So, this is a, a, a new Wilson and Blackett book. From uh, their work, though. From their work that, that you've had published. Are there any other books? Yeah, I just want to say one thing on that. Because one thing, I just want to make the big point on this is because all those points you raised about the doubt on it. Mm. You have to, this is the key. You've raised all the most important points. I had to give a preamble to get there. Paul has come in and he has infiltrated the nascent Christian movement. He's tried to become an apostle. He wasn't accepted. He's trying to become a disciple. He wasn't accepted. Somehow he's forced his way into be the one creating the new Christian message. Now, don't forget, if this is correct, Jesus and the original message, that's gone. They've left. Mm -hmm. They've gone to Britain. Mm -hmm. Paul is writing later. Paul has got to create a version of Christianity, which is the one we know. And this is where, like you said, he draws on the ancient Egyptian Osiris myths, the same myth 
was used for Darius the Great, or Cyrus the Great, sorry, you know, the idea of the, the virgin birth and found in the reeds, all these kind of narratives, that's been created by the Roman church. The original Christian message, that's already gone, that's already in Britain, right. before the New Testament. Yeah. And the idea of Peter being the first pope, all that is nonsense. If you look in the Bible, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Linus, Linus is the son of King Caradoc. Yeah. This is where you get the British uh, yeah. links. Yeah. I've heard Alan say that uh, Christianity came to Britain and yes. then was taken to Rome. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, so this is what makes history so interesting, Ross, is that there is a debate about these subjects. Yes. And uh, you welcome people to come onto your YouTube channel and refute that uh, yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah, yeah, came yeah, to exactly. Britain. You, you know, you want to have that discussion yes. and you want yes. to have that debate and you want new ideas. Yes. So you, you're open to, as long as people aren't being vitriolic and, uh, and throwing things at each other, as long as they're debating in a, in a, in a decent mm. way, you're happy to entertain you know, all, all debate on these historical this subjects. This is how the subject develops, yeah. The problem is that it's like red rag to a bull or a dog whistle. Every time you say the words Wilson and Blackett, you just get the same vitriol all the time. It's very difficult to actually get them to say, OK, what is your, which part of their work do you have an issue with? You know, what is it you have a problem with? They always do ad hominem, it's called, isn't it? They just attack their personalities and yeah. that kind of thing. It's very yeah. frustrating from that point of view. Now, so your YouTube channel is um, Britain's Hidden History. Ross, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Britain's Hidden History, one word, and then Ross. But right. you'll find it anyway. Right. And just tell us how often you update it and, and what, what's on there. What, people, what will people find there? Oh, on the YouTube channel? Yes. Oh, it's almost 500 videos now. <laughs> right. So, uh, so what I suggest, if you go on there, just if you type in Alan Wilson or Wilson or Blackett or Ross Broadstock, it'll come up because there's, there's, there's now, we just passed 5,000 subscribers. Uh, followers, so it's right. getting quite big. So you can look up almost any topic if you search it and go through the videos. And the big event, if you like, is uh, every Sunday evening there's a live show, eight o'clock, right. where you get me talking about these subjects. Yeah. And, uh, and usually it's about one and a half to two thousand people watch every Sunday, which just amazes me. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. we're on episode next week will be episode one hundred and twenty. Right, well, hopefully after this goes out, you'll have a few more viewers. Yeah, 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 it would be nice to see. Because every time I talk to Alan, I say, Alan, we've got 5,000 people following us now. And he's like, oh, it should be 50,000, you know. I know what he's like. All right, so let's come on to the, the Cumroglyphics book. Right, uh, So, you. Um, as you say, this is an incredible discovery, which... Uh, I, I did see that you were on, is it uh, S4C? Yes, yes, S4C. So that's mainstream TV, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Channel Pedro yeah, right, the Welsh right. language uh, station. So how did I they... Wonder, I don't know if someone junior got their knuckles wrapped for showing that, but they did a very good treatment of it, I have to say. It's really well presented, very fair. Right. So let me just give my own potted understanding of this, right? Yeah, go on. I don't yeah, want to steal on. it from you. No, so no, 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 no. It's, it's not uh, my discovery either. <laughs> hier hieroglyphics consist yeah. of uh, a, a lot of pictures. Mm -hmm. You look at the picture, you, you, you state what that picture is of. So it might be a dog, it might be um, a shoe or whatever it is. Yes. yes. You, you take that word, you then find the Welsh word for what that means. Yes. And it will often have another meaning because Welsh words often have two meanings. And you take the other meaning, and that's that. That is what that word is, which you can then translate into English. Yes. Some of the words are just the the the, the picture is a syllable, so it might be two pictures. You take the picture, you say what it is, you convert it to Welsh. You take the other picture, you do the same. There might be a, there might be another word that means the same. You put them together, and it makes a new word. And the actual symbols, so it may be a lion and, and a, whatever, a sword or something like that, yep, yep. It, doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with them. It, it's, it, it's just a way of verbalising the word. So, Bang so, on. so that's, how come the academics haven't, haven't, haven't discovered that? Well, it, well, so just show us some examples. All right, well, the, the reason is they won't, they won't consider the Welsh language because I think Politically, if you say come right, all the way back to Egypt, you've got to explain the, how, how the language moves, right. haven't you? So the only way you can interpret these hieroglyphs in Egypt is by using the Welsh language. That's yes. what, that's what you, you, you've The amazing seen. thing is that... Now, why is, just before we yeah, go, on, because yeah. a lot of people will yeah. laugh at that. They'll say, yeah, oh, yeah. bloody hell, everything's Welsh. Everything's got to yeah, be yeah, Welsh, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. Why is it that it's the Welsh language that you need in order to interpret the symbols in hieroglyphs? Right. Why is that? Excellent what, what, question. That's right? the core of all of it, yes. Right. I think for a lot of people, it's easy to think of it as um, 
Kamraig is a descendant of ancient Assyrian. Mm -hmm. it, that, that, I, I get a bit freaked out this idea of these blokes building the pyramids, chatting in Welsh and stuff. But if you think of it, Kamraig is a very ancient language. Mm -hmm. And the, the main words and the main roots of the words have stayed consistent all the way through that time, right? A T is still a house. You know, the basic words are still the same. Now, if you look back at the, the work they were doing into languages and everything back in the 1840s, by the way, this, this was first thought of in the 1790s. They were published papers in the 1790s showing how strange it is that the syntax of hieroglyphs seems to be the same as Welsh. They seem to have seven vowels and so does Welsh. They, they, would, they were spotting similarities. Yeah. And in the 1840s, this really took hold. And you've got uh, people like von Bunsen, who was uh, a Prussian academic. He, what his theory was that uh, all these languages, or most, not all languages, but a lot of the Western languages have a, a shared source. There was one original language which has spread out from there. And this makes a lot of sense from the evidence we have. For example, a lot of people are aware that Sanskrit has a lot of very similar words to um, Welsh, a lot of crossover. So some people say, ah, well, therefore Welsh must come from Sanskrit. Well, I don't know how a language got from India to Wales. I don't know. I don't know how Welsh could have got to India either. But they could have a shared source. This is the thing. So the language has gone off to India. It's gone off to Wales. It's gone off to lots of other places. The difficulty is most countries, like English is a classic example. The English language, I mean, that's been beaten all over the place. You know, it's so many foreign influences and migrations and invasions. It's very hard to work out the roots of English. Incidentally, there are a lot more Welsh words in English than people realise. I'll give one example in a moment. Make sure I remember to do it. Is that, uh, so, so what we're looking at is really, Alan, is this wonderful word Alan uses, is it's, it's a living fossil, the Welsh language. It's a living fossil of how people spoke all that time ago. Because Wales has been stuck on the edge of Europe. It's never been really invaded. This thing about the Romans bringing all the words and all that is just loot. They, they, if anything, they would have an Etruscan language very similar anyway. Mm -hmm. The idea there's no word for a bridge or a door or a window until the Romans told us what they were is kind of a bit weird. But anyway, they would have had a similar root language as well. So we're not talking about borrowed words. Or if they did, they borrowed the other way. So what happened there was fascinating because there was um, huge academic opposition to this. You can imagine in the, in the, the English uh, at, at senior levels. The Oxford and Cambridge, they were poo-pooing it, but the evidence was really strong. And this gained real momentum. This was really taking off in the 1880s, 1890s. Mm -hmm. This has been accepted. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they were forced to form a, um, what do they call it, a sort of academic research committee or some grand title they gave it, a working group, to look into this. So they got top academics from Oxford and Cambridge. They were researching it. And then they just delayed and delayed and delayed. And then World War I came along. And suddenly it just got forgotten. It mm -hmm. just got forgotten whether deliberately or accidentally, in mean, World War I, a lot of things probably got forgotten as a rowing experience. So if you went back to 1900, you'd find this was on the academic agenda being discussed. Mm. World War I, it got swept under the carpet, and then it resurfaced again. Uh, there's a uh, oh, Reg, I forgot his name, surname for a second. It's been revisited, so the 70s, and then the 80s, Wilson and Blackett, the first one, says, well, let's just see if it works. Mm. No one had done that. <laughs> it literally took them half an hour to see the first few words coming. Right. So let's let's yeah, go on. give us a few examples, Ross, and, and, and give me the page reference number for your book so that I can put that on the screen. Okay. Right. Well, I can send you all the graphics too. Yeah, because the the first thing is um, the most well, one to start with is, is the easiest one in many ways is welcome. So welcome is uh, a cloiso in Welsh. Well, how do you draw welcome? How would you possibly draw welcome? I, I, yeah. I can't think of any way you can do it. Hmm. Whereas crois. Kreuz and Kreuz, so pretty much the same word, just an O on the end, is cross. Mm -hmm. So you see a cross, that cross means welcome. So, so it's that a cross and hieroglyphs means welcome. So yes. you, trans, you translate that to yep. Kreuz. Yeah, uh, so when you find uh, that, you uh, see and welcome. Then, and then that means welcome. Yeah, because one of the things I should so, explain as well is that the, one of the huge differences between this and the sort of consensus madness you've ended up with, this Egyptology, is that uh, Egypto speak, whatever they call it, is they, they are under the impression that the, the symbols are letters or that you need four or five hieroglyphs to make a word, hmm. whereas actually each hieroglyph is a word. Yeah. And like you said, very, your, your okay, summary is excellent. Now and again, you combine them. Occasionally, it's, it's two, yes. two, two, two pictures yes. make one word. They are a syllable, yes. but usually it's a word. So Generally, they're one word. Give us some more examples. And well, if a you, great example showing um, uh, 
showing this idea of a duality and, and why you might use more than one hieroglyph sometimes is that you mentioned the goose, one of my favourite examples. So goose in Welsh is guith, and guith is also like knowledge. It's also guitho, I think, has become the word for like technology, and it's, it's this kind of knowledge. And, so it's quite an important word. So that's why goose would appear next to someone's name, and it always appears next to the sun. Now, in modern Welsh, we say a rai for the sun, but that's a kind of modern corruption. If you look at the spelling, it's a ra. Rai is just the way you happen to pronouncing it these days for various reasons I won't go into now. But a ra in Welsh is still the sun. It's amazing. After right. all these years, you've still got ra as in ra, the sun god. Yeah. So ra is the sun next to the gwith. So you've got knowledge of the power, because ra is the power. Ra gwith, ra gwith is the Lord. It's like in a church on a Sunday, you worship ra gwith, that's the Lord. Mm. So you've got ra gwith. So you, and you've got, it, it's just so easy. I mean, your summary basically yeah. said it. So you, <laughs> give give us some more examples of Egyptian symbols and what they, what they then mean in, in Welsh and then in English. Okay, well, I, so another one of my favourites is, the, um, is this sort of semicircle shape. It's the flat bottom of a semicircle. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what, one thing I want to point out as well, this, this deciding what the hieroglyphs are and represent is not new. This is the bizarre thing about it. Still using the same, uh, I don't know how, in fairness, I do not know how the mainstream academics worked out what these symbols were. Some of them are a little bit abstract. Yeah. Without knowing the language. It's mm -hmm. remarkable. Like the one is like uh, that shape. And they've worked out somehow that that's a cloak draped on the back of a chair, or draped somehow. Well, in Welsh, cloak is Sagan, and Sir is eternity. So you've got like this a sense of established and eternal is, is the cloak. Mm -hmm. uh, another one they've worked out is the flat bottom of the semicircle. They've managed to work out that's a cake, right? right? And in Welsh, you've got Tish and Lap, which looks exactly like that. And in the, in the book, I'll, you'll see a picture of my wife making some Tish and Lap. Well, T is you are. So you've got Tish and Lap, T. The T part is a significant part. So then, what does that mean then? What is the, what, T, what's you are. the word? You are, it's actually two words. Right. And then, and you are, so if you see that in the hieroglyphs, it means you are. Yes. Right, okay. You are, simple Can you as that. Give us some well, more. That's a, good, a nice easy example then, which you see all over the place in hieroglyphs. You'll see a square. Sometimes it's more obvious it's a door. And now Budge way back in the 1880s, that worked out as a door, because in some right. you can actually see the like, bars of wood. Right. If it, like, so it's a door. Mm -hmm. Well, in Welsh, we've got drws is the normal word, but porth is the entrance. So you live near a place called Porth, because that's the entrance into South Wales. If you go down to Tiger Bay, mm -hmm. it's Porth Tiger in Welsh. Porth is the entrance. Right. Well, por, por is the root word, so por is the power. So por t, power you are, you are the power, because you have to remember the syntax, the word order in Welsh. So the example Alan always gives, in English you would say, you are a good boy. In Welsh, you would say, there's a good boy, you are. The you are comes at the end of the sentence. Yeah. This is, and you can see this in the hieroglyphs. The yeah. syntax works brilliantly. So yeah, I think it's the same in Hebrew. The, the, the order is different. It's yeah, the same as yeah. Welsh. Yeah, I don't go on to Hebrew. No? You don't. I, well, if you go on to Hebrew... No, that? no, I... I, I, I but, it, but go on. G give Hebrew, me Hebrew is give a resurrected language. This is not a, it's not a Right, okay, so, so convince like. everyone that these hieroglyphs, if you, if you say them in Welsh, if you say what you see, you say what you see in Welsh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then convert it into English, then, it, then you can read that sentence. Well, well, one of the, give well, us well, some more examples. All right, then, okay, yeah, yeah, give you give loads of examples. One of my favourites, then, is like this shape three mountains, and you think, well, why would have three mountains? What does that to do with? We look in the Welsh dictionary, three is tree, manith, tree manith is an explorer. And there it is. Right. So if you're trying to describe an explorer, you put tree manith. Oh, another one of my favourites is the, um, you get these little snakes with a really exaggerated fork on their head. Right. So you've got the, the uh, whatever snake that is, but it's the fork. Fork is the key. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, they're on the fork viper, isn't it? Fork viper. So the fork, fork, forth, that's the way, so that's the way. So uh, uh, the, the example which is fascinating and what throws everything out, which is why I'm very low to even mention it, is that they, they had no idea how to read these hieroglyphs when you go back to the era of Champollion and uh, these people. They were trying to work it out. We're back, because Napoleon, with a good little bit of background, uh, 1790s, Napoleon has invaded Egypt. They've come across all this stuff. Europe has gone. Egypt mad, you know, there's big exhibitions, there's hieroglyphs, they're carving, they're sawing off bits of 
you know, whole <laughs> bits of uh, hieroglyphs, and everyone's gone crazy about it, and a race was on. Who can translate it the first? So you've got, on the French corner, you've got Champollion, who has promised personally, Napoleon, I will translate this for you. And this has got him out of being an officer in the army. You've got to remember the carnage, Napoleonic battles, right? So he's got a vested interest, and he's promised the emperor, and this will prove that the republics can outperform the old kingdoms, the, the old ancient regimes, you know? So, so the British, the English, they put up their champion as Thomas Young, who was the genius of the day. He's the one who worked out how your eyes can see different colours and he, how to make safe uh, gas lighting in London. He was the Mr. Go-To, absolute genius. There's right. lots of um, laws in medicine still named after him, right. like working out dosages for children. So he was a genius. He worked out very quickly that you could not crack it without knowing the language. It's impossible. The Welsh language. Yeah, well, you didn't know the language is the problem. Whatever language is behind, right. you the, need the to know The language that's behind the hieroglyphs. You which, need to know it, yes. Which the most compatible language is Welsh. Yes. Right. They guessed Ptolemy, all right? Yeah. So Ptolemy was the first one they guessed, and mm. it's a complete guess. And they looked at it, and they went, oh, hang on a second. We think Ptolemy is something to do with this. And they just did it by intuition and by deduction, guesswork. So they went, ah, the little square, that makes a put sound. And the little, the one I just told you about, Porth, yeah. And then the little T sound, well, that's a T. And then they did the, um, there's olives or a sling, depending on which way you want to read it. It doesn't really matter. It works both ways. That's an O. Oh. And the lion must be a L. And he went through all of the name of Ptolemies. Hmm. And this is went down the wrong uh, right. cul-de-sac because they thought they were letters. Right. Now, what's happening in this situation, to, i give you the sentence and a second. Each image was just a letter, so you need quite a few pictures in order to make a word. Yes, right. yes. But you've actually got a sentence there in your yes. opinion. Yes, because the problem you've got is Ptolemy's is, uh, was Greek. Mm. This, is, this is after Alexander died, you've got the, the, the yeah. takeover of the, the Demochi. Where, uh, mm. it, it, this is um, a Greek name, which does not translate well into hieroglyphs. So what they've done They've tried to pick words which describe the person, so you can read the sentence about Ptolemies, you know, you're the powerful one and you have this great wealth, you've been in the country certain forever, Ptolemies. That's a sentence, and you can, it's like an acronym, like NATO or mm -hmm. NASA or something. If you use the first syllable, you can make the name. So it's a really clever way of doing his name. But it only applies when you're doing these Greek names. Right. The rest of the time, they don't use that system. And this is what Thomas Young, the genius, worked out. He said, no, whatever's going on in there doesn't work on the outside. It cannot possibly work. There's a different right. system. But Champollion said, yes, there was. And I get to the, so the, the key one, he said, I reckon it's the same system everywhere, and it must predate the Greeks. And then he found the hieroglyph for Ramesses. And this is the one I'll tell you the, secret, the, the sentence, right? I'm not right. avoiding it. Is that okay. Ramesses... He predates the Greeks. So this is when Champollion had this great, I've discovered it moment, you know, and he ran out and he ran down to the local thing and said, there's Ramses. I've won the argument with Thomas Young. It's a classic false dichotomy. Right. The answer translated anything at all. But what he's trying to say is that because Ramses has got those, remember to the cloaks at the end? Mm -hmm. So that's Sir, Sir in Welsh, the eternal, the eternal one, right? Right. It's the same as on the end of Ptolemy's. He's like, look, 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 you can see the same thing happening. You've got the sun, that's Ra. So he's mm -hmm. on the right coast. He's like, yeah, it is Ra. He ignored the line, which is a shame, because the line represents the place in Welsh, Ma. So you've got Ra, Ma. Mm -hmm. So now the problem is, because he's ignored that, he's looking at the vegetables, thinking that must be... Um, uh, he's looking... Sorry, hang on. So you've got Ra, Ma. He thinks that must be an M. And it looks a bit like an M. Mm -hmm. So we'll go with that being M. And this is the, the disaster, because that isn't M, that's the Ur er part. That's a villain, that's vegetables. You can see the little potatoes, whatever, growing under the ground. Right. And then you've got the circe at the end. So what, what you got in the book then? You've got uh, what it is. Mm -hmm. So the sun, the yeah. power, Ra. Then you've got the line showing it's a place. You can't just ignore that line. It means it's the power of this place. And then you've got the string of vegetables, the villain, which gives us the, the air, which is order. And then the, the se, remember se is the eternal. Right. So, oh, interesting thing with whenever there's two of something, if you look at Welsh counting, very similar to French, incidentally. So you have in doi, tree. Mm -hmm. Well, doi, do, is God. So doi and do, phonetically, are the same. Right. So whenever you see two of something, that represents 
God. Same with French, if you think. Un deux toi, and deux is God, right. which is an interesting coincidence, or maybe something connected. So that, this word here, or this sentence, that's a sentence in hieroglyphs, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you can read the sentence. Right, so, so we've got a bird, we've got like a curly E, we've got a, yeah, a, quith, a yeah. half a circle, a triangle, a lemon shape, a that's hand it. and another lemon shape. Yes. So just go through that, that word there then, All right, or that okay. sentence. Okay. Well, How you, so the bird, there's a bird there, so what's the English word? Right, well, the first, the, first, the first thing is, well, you've got Adar or Adar in there, so you get the Adar, which is to reassert. Now, what I've noticed is that, uh, for a start, you'll see that the... Um, the animals or birds, or usually the hands as well, point to the start of the word. Because sometimes it goes left to right, sometimes it goes right to left. Mm. So you just look where the bird's pointing or the animal's pointing. So you can see yeah. the bird comes first. And what you'll notice when you read lots and lots of hieroglyphs, which is quite easy to do once you, once you understand what, how it works, it's almost like a full stop in reverse. That bird shows the start of a sentence. Right. Now, some of these sentences, the problem is using these um, uh, they, 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 cartouches, they're called. And they thought to always mean names, which I'm not even sure that's correct either, because anyway, that's another topic, is that um, they are extreme examples. And the sentences look really clumsy. They don't, the sentences aren't great, because what someone's had to do is create an acronym to sound the word. Mm -hmm. So if I said to you NATO, mm -hmm. you've got to think of four words that begin with N-A-T-O. Right. You know, you might come up with all sorts. So the sentences can look a bit clumsy, but that's because these are Greek names. And it's trying to force a foreign language. And a great example of that, I'm just going to show you a picture, is that uh, one of my favourite ones that really gives support for it being Welsh is there's no X, and there's no X in Welsh. Right. So if you look at the um, cartouche or the spelling of Alexandra, or Alexander, sorry, as Alexander the Great, there's no X in it because they didn't have an X. So what they've done, same as we do in Welsh, they put the letter C and the letter S next to you, the two sounds. Mm -hmm. So it's Alex. So if you go to Wales and you look for a sign for a taxi, mm -hmm. you'll see it's spelled in Welsh T-A-C-S-I because mm -hmm. there's no X. So you can see the same thing when they describe an Alexander. Um, a another great one is the, um, well, all, oh, by the way, the lemon shape you talk about is the mouth. It's a mouth. That's a mouth. It looks it? like a lemon, yes. Yeah. So you've yeah, got okay. roch, roch, which is to proclaim. The water is brilliant because you still see this used on signs in Wales. It's amazing. This hieroglyph still exists because it, although it looks like water, it actually represents swimming or floating. Novio mm -hmm. is a bit of genius by Wilson and Blackett. And you still see swimming pools with this and Novio written next to it. Uh, and I've done some real fun ones in here with popular names like, you know, how you would do David Beckham and all that kind of stuff. Right, can, right. Because I want to make it clear to people, they are not really good sentences. The better sentences are read in the general text. But right. The, but the, the reason the cartouche is so important is because that's where the whole of Egyptology started. Mm -hmm. They started guessing the names and then making some really bad guesses. Mm -hmm. And for example, the, one of the biggest disasters, two big disasters, one, Champollion ended up with R, M, S, S for Ramesses. He thought that's an R, that's an M, an S, an S. He missed out the, the, the space, the, the place. Mm -hmm. So he looked at it and gone, ah, RMSS must be Ramesses, therefore the Egyptians didn't use vowels. He's just, Alexandros starts with a blinking vowel, starts with an A. Yeah. You yeah. go online, go on YouTube or something, you say how to read hieroglyphics. Mm. So, oh, there are no vowels in uh, hieroglyphs. And the first thing we're going to teach you is how to draw the letter A. <laughs> yeah. They'll yeah. do that straight up. So what he's done by that, and this comes back to your comment about Hebrew, which I don't want to get too much into right now, but this idea of there only being consonants and no vowels is not correct because it's ra. The vowel is, it's a sound, it's ra. Yeah. yeah. And it's ma for yeah. place. Right. And it's sir for the, for the, um, the cloak. Yeah. The vowels are included. So and there's a the, vowel and a consonant in the symbol. A, but if the, if, if the symbol doesn't include a vowel, mm -hmm. then you have to add a vowel in. And you can see loads of examples of the add the vowel in. Right. And I'm not laboring the point too much, you see uh, certain, higher, certain names, cartouches, they're not always exactly the same. There's variations. Hmm. So sometimes with Alexander, because the second um, symbol is the lion, Cleo, so it's Alexandra, they've had to try and wobble it a bit. Well, the le, you don't need to put an e in. But sometimes they do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do put the corn sheaf, which is er, which is the e sound they want. So some, a priest in one place has gone, I'll spell it like this, because it says Alexandra. And the other one's go, well, er means he is. Hmm. So it doesn't change anything. I can drop the he is in. 
So if I'm reading the sentence, it's like the great one he is and all this kind of stuff. And the other one just says the great one, blah, blah, blah. You know, mm -hmm. So the variations work brilliantly. And to my mind, actually explain how it works better. Yeah. So assuming this work is correct, it means that the civilization that wrote the hieroglyphs were speaking in tongue in a very similar language to Welsh. But at that time in ancient Egypt, obviously, they did not use the English alphabet. So when the people who spoke this language migrated to Britain, they brought the language with them. And only some time later in Britain was the English alphabet then used to try and spell the words of the Welsh language. This makes sense to me because there are sounds in Welsh that there are no letters for. So the hl sound in hlantrisant spelt with two L's, or the use of the letter Y as a vowel, the U uh sound. I think this is why, if you're English like me, the written Welsh language seems perplexing. Uh, it's trying to use an alphabet that wasn't designed for the language. So just to, just to recap, the book by uh, Wilson Blackett, Moses and the Hieroglyphs, yes. It, it takes the techniques that you've described in this book yes. and it interprets them and it, and it spells out what those hieroglyphs are saying and then it derives the history from that. Yes. Right, all right. Well, if you're interested, <laughs> if you're interested in Ross's book, um, yes. you can get it from your website. Yeah, Cumberglyphics, go to cumberglyphics.com or... Uh, yes. And also the Moses and the Hieroglyphs. Yes. Now, we, we've been going for quite some time now. Yeah, we've, yeah, yeah, we've, still yeah, got, yeah. we've still got stuff to cover. You can see I can fill a two-hour show every Sunday. Easily, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, let's just... Oh, can I do one word? Sorry, one word. I'm just going to jump in, so I know you want to Go move on. Go on then, yeah. Just to give an example of where there's lots of Welsh words in English, which you wouldn't expect. Mm. Now, one of the people editing this, I've got to thank Paul Hartel, my editor you know, over in America. He's Germanic background. He's in America. No interest in promoting Welsh, mm -hmm. but he's a great editor. And he volunteered to, to edit the book, to make it read well and all that kind of thing. And one of the things he pointed out, well, how can mattress, mattress be an ancient Egyptian word or a Welsh word? Mm. You know, mattress, the springy things you sleep on at night. Yeah. Well, if you look at the, the breakdown of that, you've got mar again, that place. Right. And trasu is the old Welsh verb to spread out. To right. Spread. right. So before you go to sleep, mm -hmm. you spread out a place to lie on. That's matras. So right. there's lots of words in English which actually have a Welsh origin, and everyone assumes that so, the words have been borrowed from English into Welsh. Right. So what would that be in hieroglyphs then? Oh, so Ma matras. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What so, is mar and what is trust? Well, matras is a symbol. So you get a mar. You get a mar. It's like right. a cube. I know it's a mattress. It's like a killed up mattress. Right. So from that we get ma, we get the place. So sometimes you use a mattress. So draw the hieroglyph there then? Well, it just, it's just that. Right. And just that means yeah. mattress. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, right. Let's, let's um, mention now, uh, in Wilson and Blackett's work, yes. they refer to star mounds. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, so yes. so there, are, there are ancient mounds all over the place. Uh, they're often referred to as burial mounds, or sometimes they'll say it is a, it's, it's a mound being built by Normans to put a, a fort on there. Mott and Bailey, yeah. Mott and <coughs> Bailey, right. Uh, now, often there's little evidence that, that it was a burial mound. It's been assumed to be a burial mound. In other words, they've not always found bodies or bones in no, there. No. And the same applies with some of the fort. This, uh, th there's no evidence that the, you know, there's no wood left over yeah, from yeah, the yeah, fort yeah, or right, whatever. Yeah. So, um, now in some occasions, possibly they're they're not forts and they're not burial mounds, but they're they're, they're built as a star mound. So, uh, just explain uh, w w what that means, Ross. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, the the one book which um, I haven't included on the list as physical copies now is Discovery of the Ark of the Covenant which I'm, I'm making available as a download PDF. You can buy copies. But I, this, this, uh, I'll be careful what I say here for legal reasons, but there's someone publishing it and, uh, and collecting the revenue and not giving anything back to Wilson and Blackett, it's fair to say. All right. So you can buy it. And, and to be honest, the, the book they produce is well produced and it's a reasonably priced. There's no point in me producing it as well. You can get holds of it. And I, I'll, I've got the PDF right. as well. And what they show in there, this is going to a whole another massive area, which I'll try and make as concise as I possibly can, because it shows reflections with ancient Babylon mm -hmm. and Britain. And this goes on this principle of as above, so below. It's like the four quarters of Wales and the four quarters of Ireland. You notice things, you may have observed this, that for example, if you look at Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, if you divide it into four corners, 
Ireland's most obvious example to use. The northeast is like sort of military area, it's around Belfast and all those sort of unfortunate things. Northwest is a more spiritual, that kind of um, mythical and that kind of area. Then the southwest is the farming area, actually yeoman, and the southeast is your uh, capital and your main centres of commerce. Mm -hmm. It's the same in Wales, Cardiff in the southeast, David southwest. You got the Gwynedd with all the mountains and the you know the dragons and all that. And the northeast is the, the where all the fighting takes place. Same, mm -hmm. you, you can draw a similar thing with England and all sorts. So the theory is that that this started in Babylonia, that they would divide their lands up in, in, into areas for different functions. If you yeah, like. yeah, and, you have, and, yes. and that that's that still applies. Yeah, bizarre, today. isn't it? Right. It's amazing, isn't it? Right. And you have the fifth one in the middle, then, which is the, um, the sort of where everyone comes together. So, uh, there's Gudfwerthion, I think, in Welsh, and in, I think you've got Meath or somewhere in the middle of Ireland. And you can do all these things. That's another subject. But the, what they also seem to have done is, is a why is a wonderful thing, but you can only conjecture, really, was to have uh, as above, so below. So you would map out the stars onto your land. And we've found examples of this in various places. South, uh, there's Hugh, Hugh Evans uh, has written a wonderful book showing how the mountains of Gwynedd uh, conform to this. So that might be the first one because you can't really move mountains around. Mm -hmm. So that will probably be first because the mountains match. Mm. Uh, uh, you, can, you can look at all the star constellations. And that's a whole, uh, again, another massive subject. This is why you just can't cover everything. In southeast Wales, the mountains don't match exactly, so they seems they've created these mounds. And some are, like you said, being used as burial mounds. It might even be the case that some have been used as Norman Mott and Bale and castles. Why not? If you want to build a castle and it's a ready built mound, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you use it? Yeah. But there's no evidence for that having taken place. Yeah. No, uh, so, so the idea is then so you can plot, heaven knows how they worked it out, the mounds to match the stars. And in some places, like in southwest Wales, They've used cromlechs, you know, piles of stones or large stones, and they, they tell a star story. All right, so just to recap, <laughs> if you uh, get a Google Earth map and, yes. you, and you plot where these mounds are, yes. you, it will map out a known star constellation, yes. right? Uh, so that the mounds were possibly built to revere the heavens. And uh, you know, we've, your wife uh, yeah, 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 came Andrew, up yeah. with with a good suggestion, was yes. that she thought that that if you haven't got a map in your pocket, and you and you there's a mound there and a mound there, it, it's providing a. You look at the sky and you've got a map of the ground. Yeah, and yeah, it seemed, it seemed better than that. Yeah, because the work with Steve Willits is doing as well is that the place yeah. names. So, will so this tell is you. so yeah. Steve Willits yeah. is another researcher that you're working with. On yeah, a, he's doing some fantastic on, stuff. Yes. On, a, on a book, and this is his. This is his map of um, what South Wales. Yes, and and it, and, and, and it on it is um, a, a map of, of yes. his, the star constellations, and he's lining up various mounds with various uh, stars and the place names. This and, is crucial. Yeah. This is crucial. Like, why would you suddenly find? Because uh, he's showing he goes right back to ancient Babylon. Because the other thing you have to remember as well is ancient Babylonian zodiacs, which is like the Egyptian zodiac as opposed to the modern. Greek mm -hmm. zodiac, so you have to be yeah. a little bit careful. Yeah. But like, why would you suddenly have a farm halfway up the hill called um, Left Shoulder Farm? You've got things like this. The place names are absolutely key. This is why it's <coughs> so important that we protect our place names and don't get changed to Dunroman or whatever. Because you can, you can follow the whole story. And like where you are, Mirtha, mm -hmm. well, everyone's taught that that means the martyr, you know? That's, Mirtha means martyr, and it's to do with... Um, uh, she was there, and there's a raid, and she prayed, and they cut red off, whatever. Anyway, this is the story, right? But curiously, what Steve found, you can, Mirtha could actually be a corruption of Mircha. And Mircha then suddenly you're into astronomical stuff then. And if you look around this area, you'll find lots of places with names all connected to the same planet. Yeah. And, 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 then you, and what Steve's doing, amazing research, is following all the yeah. The start and, and finding loads and loads right. of places of villages, farms, hills, right. fields, give more supporting evidence. Yeah, because you, you've got modern day naming of stars, right? And then you've got the Romans had a different set of names yes. for the stars. Yes. That star, yes, it, yes, 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 it's yes, not yes, the yes. pole star, it's something yes, else. That's right. And yes. then if you go further back in time to Babylonian, they named their stars with different words. Yes. And if you translate the star, the, that into you might find that it's the same name as the mound in Welsh. Correct. 
So they've, I mean, I don't know, I, I've not looked at any of that. How on earth I, that could happen, I mean, it just freaks you. Yeah. Uh, trying to think about it. Right. Is, so if you, so if, you get, if you get all of the stars, you convert them to the oldest sort of Babylonian words for that star, and then look, look for those place names of the mounds. That's, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That's what, what he's doing, doing yeah. yeah. And what's remarkable is it's, 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 it's working out all over South Wales. And one of the things, uh, uh, this, 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 is a, this is further, this is what I'm trying to show this a living subject, this is further than Wilson and Blackett went. Because mm -hmm. what you're discovering is you can actually follow things like the story of Gilgamesh mm -hmm. through the place names. Like uh, where we went to um, Garth, for example, well, Garth is Welsh for battlements. Well, if you look at ancient Uruk, that's also the word for battlements. And on the, t on the top of Penarth, you've got Penturch. So you've got Penturch, Uruk, mm -hmm. which is the capital, the head of Uruk. Uh, and then you can follow the place names. It might seem a stretch on its own. Then just down, Steve's found all this. Just from there, there's a place called Henstaff. The old staff doesn't make any sense. You look at a Babylonian star map, and you see the guy with the with the, 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 the staff, mm -hmm. everything going round it, just below where the Uruk thing, and it's like, and then you've got the, the, the uh, Kifili. Mm -hmm. Philly, uh, it fits on where the stag should be. And in old Welsh, Philly is the stag. It, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's and, everywhere. And, and the shoulder that you mentioned earlier is part of what? Oh, that's Tiamat, the ancient Babylonian goddess or god Tiamat who fights the original origin stuff. We're going right back to now to Gilgamesh and all that kind of really early Babylonian stories. And you can piece together all her body. There's the left shoulder. And then... So this farm, which is called Left Shoulder Farm, yeah. the, it's actually... There's a, there's a set of mounds yeah, somewhere... Yeah, you plot it out and there's Tiamat. Which, yeah. is, which is the, the star constellation. Yeah, the head, the foot. And that's why that farm's called... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though they don't know why the farm no. is called that. Yeah. No, and, and it gets even better because then you've got the... Tiamat had the sacred tablets, the secret of life. Whoever holds the tablets controls everything. And you've got there the field of the tablet. Then across the other side, you've got the Garden of Eden. The, and it's just a grotty f hill. You know? Right. So it's a huge... That is, that's, um, we need more people researching that because right. it, it's so vast. Yeah, I did... When I interviewed Alan Wilson, he did pull out this big star map. <laughs> and, <laughs> the uh, famous I, I didn't realise how important that was. Yes, uh, but, yes. um, uh, you know, it had... It was a big drawing uh, yes. uh, of... Glamorgan, I guess, uh, with various... Well, a bit bigger than that, yeah. V various Gwent, mounds. Yeah, yeah, towards the beacons, yes. Right, yes. various mounds on there, and uh, I just filmed it. <laughs> and, and apparently, people yeah. have been freezing that, yeah. trying, to, trying to get the... But he's given you all that research. Yes, you, yeah, yeah, you, yes. I've got, got that map now, yes, you, as well. So right. I'm trying to make all this available as quick as I can. Right. So other people can do research as well, because his approach is different to Steve's, because mm -hmm. he, I, I, he's on a different line of research. Now, one of the key things... This is an issue that's gone at the moment, rather tragically is that there's... Um, so Steve Willits. Yes, Steve right. Willits. Yeah, he's, he's great to talk to as well. And uh, I have him on my show a few times. And there's... The, um, you go up on St. Genneth Common, up by Egloisil and Common. It seems to have two names. The, what Alan Wilson discovered there was that they've got the rocks and everything, stones, are arranged. It's almost like a, a classroom. This is a mini version of it. And if you stand in the right place, you can follow the stones in different directions and they'll point you to different stars that would right. be where you'd learn your craft and the tragedy is at the moment they want to put a wind farm up there yeah. or an electricity thinking mm. generator and um those stones could all get moved or or ruined or destroyed or something so it gets a little bit complicated because you seem to have more than one star map i mean you've got, if, we're talking about thousands of years here mm -hmm. so for whatever reasons they've done it you can find more than one so that's that's what i think has confused researchers yeah i mean this is another thing mm. Uh, we're going back thousands of years from Arthur, really, uh, mm, to, mm. to this stuff, aren't we? The mounds. I would think so, though. I wonder how much of it was. Uh, I don't know how old they are. I mean, they might have still been building these things in Arthur's time. Can I say one thing on the map you mentioned when Angela was saying about a map? It's, it's the most brilliant mapping system. It's like having GPS on your phone. Because mm. if I turn up and I say, "Oh, where am I?" Oh, this is Left Shoulder Farm. And if you know your astrolo astronomy, you look up and go, oh, "There's a Left Shoulder." I'm actually trying to get to the ferocious warrior. Mm -hmm. Where's the other star? You know, well, that's such and such star. Oh, okay, I need to go that way. Yeah, you know, it, it works brilliantly. Yeah, it's now like GPS. Now on this, on um, <coughs> Steve Willett's map, he's got Orion. But you think that there was maybe different eras mm -hmm. where they were building these mounds to revere the heavens, and that there's another Orion in a different place to where he's yes. placed it. So yes. I, I asked Ross if he would take me 
to all of the all of the mounds of the Orion constellation. So yes. we've we, we've been out and we filmed at each of the mounds. So I, I've set him a challenge to, well, what we're going to do is we're going to draw on a Google map. Um, well, it doesn't have to be Google on a map uh, where where we visited each of the mounds that we filmed, and then we're going to overlay the Orion star constellation yeah. and, and and just see how close. Let's see how close that comes up. Now, now, now <laughs> just to add that that it's it, that it's not perfect, is it? Because maybe they couldn't build a mound in a particular place for a particular yes. reason. Yeah. Then, Okay, so we're at a site now which is undisputably a mound, as we see by the, the road sign, West Mount Crescent. Um, so tell us where we are, Ross, and uh, tell us a little bit about this mound and how it may fit into uh, the Orion theory. Well, this is Tom Tegg, which is there. This is the place I spent most of my childhood. And amazingly, I used to play on this mound. So clearly, they've when they've built this housing estate, they've felt that this mound is important enough to put a fence around it and protect it because it hasn't been built on. Um, so they, officially, it is some sort of archaeology, um, but it's classed as Norman. Is that right, yeah, Ross? Yeah, well, that's the way it is in Wales. Everything, nothing's ever Welsh. So this is classed officially as uh, Norman Martin Bailey Castle. And if you read the information boards we put up recently, explains there how this has been preserved to give us this great insight into uh, medieval building and whatever. But uh, it's, it's not a great argument. Now, the first thing I would say is, if it is a Norman, if there ever was a Norman fort on there, it doesn't change that it might be in an earlier mound. So that's the first thing you've got on the record. They can reuse the mound. If you're going to put a castle somewhere, stick it on an existing mound. But the problem is, if you look at it, militarily it's a disaster because you've got the hill's very close to it. We could just sort of lob stuff in from no distance. The size of it doesn't work. It's just not a very defensible position. And most tellingly, there's no archaeological evidence at all. Nothing has been found from there, not a pot or an arrowhead. No signs have been lived on. So it seems a real stretch, but it's a really convenient label that seems to be put on most of the star mounds and burial mounds. Right, so I'm standing on the mound now that we were just looking at, and over Ross's shoulder, you can probably see one of the Orion mounds uh, of which there are three uh, that's Orion's belt so just tell us a bit more about that uh, Ross. Yes yeah, so it's the amazing thing is uh, coming here all my life and everything you don't see them till you point them out but you can see clearly there's three mounds in a row and there were two other mounds as well which makes the full five but they're the three prominent ones that matter and if those trees weren't there you could probably just about see Castle Cork. We're at another location now which isn't publicly known as a mound but um, may have been a mound um, before it before this castle was was placed on it Ross. But we have to remember this is this is like a folly this this is built from the sort of 1870s it's not even 200 years old this castle now there is some evidence of medieval dungeons and structures like that but the mound has seemed to be potentially a lot older and Richard's brought us around the back where we don't normally go as tourists I don't really look at this part and you can certainly see this shape certainly has that mound type shape which has been bricked over so who knows what would be wonderful to find if we could would be some pictures uh, of this before they rebuilt the castle that would give us a lot of clues that would be really helpful we're at another mound now and what's interesting up there as well we noticed the mound it's not the whole hill if you like it's the mound is, is clearly a different bit on the top of the hill which is the mound right we're at another mound in the same region and what's interesting about this mound is it wasn't discovered until fairly recently or that or that you know of ross yeah this doesn't seem to be in any of um, wilson and blackett's books or anything and glenn crowver <laughs> who's a fantastic uh, old fellow who knows alan wilson from way back in the day back in the 80s he's a cardiff boy but he moved up to this area and he used to have horses and he'd come up this hill uh, to get hay and he'd noticed this over the years, he'd noticed this mound. There were also standing stones which the farmer seems to have just dragged off in the last maybe 10 years and piled up. But the, the mound, that's how he spotted it, so top marks to Len. We're on top of the mound that uh, Len told you about. Yeah, that's right, Len's mound, yeah. And again, we can see Garth Mountain in the backdrop there, uh, Ross. Yeah, yeah, and amazingly, if you look, you'll see there's a hole in the wall which Len spotted, and if you line up with a hole in the wall, that points you towards the garth. Now, I think the wall's a lot more recent, but it's curious that it's there, isn't it? 
We've moved to another mound location now and it's just behind Pew's garden centre in Morganstown. Now it doesn't look much at all. I was here about five or six years ago and it was fenced off. The mound was fenced off and you could actually see the mound but now it's all overgrown uh, so we can't really get much on camera. But um, do you want to tell us what you know about this mound well, uh, Ross? Well as you see I mean it's, it's obliterated really at the moment. It's chest high brambles. I'll come back in the winter and have another look. The trees, the problem with the trees as well is that you don't always realise is the roots destroy any chance of any future archaeology or exploration of the site. They claim to be protecting it. It's got protected signs and it's scheduled signs. It's recognised by CADU and all the authorities. This is not protecting a site. It's just putting trees in it and destroying the site. It's now almost invisible and by the time those trees come down that'll be gone. And it's been there for who knows how long, 1,000, 2,000 years, maybe longer, could be even older than that. It's heartbreaking. If you don't get some recognition of these sites, they're all going to go the same way. And it's, it gets harder every year. OK, so here is a map showing where we visited, and the red dots represent the mounds. I'm just going to move the map to one side. Then I'm going to remove the map itself, leaving just the mound layout. We see the red dots. Now let's put the Orion star constellation next to it. I tried to match the two up, but without much success. So I decided to look up the claim in Wilson and Blackett's book, Discovery of the Ark. Here's what it says. There is a very large mound at Morganstown on the east side of the Garth, which would mirror the large star Bellatrix in Orion's left shoulder. And yet other mounds at Whitchurch just inside Cardiff's north boundary is precisely where the very bright Betelgeuse in Orion's right shoulder should be. Then there is a very large mound at Castle Ammonach that was first thought to be set for the bright Bellatrix in Orion's left shoulder, but which might be for Aldebaran. On the west side of the Garth there is another huge mound placed for the bright star Saif at Tonteg and yet another huge mound for the brilliant star Rigel at Toyn Miser Grug or the Field of the Heap. So what I have done is taken two of the mounds named in this passage, Morganstown and Tonteg, and lined them up with Bellatrix and Saif. And here is what we get. We see that Orion's belt isn't closely aligned and the other mounds we visited don't seem to be connected. If we look at the other two major stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse, we can use the map to guess where they might be. I had a look on Google Earth at the location where Rigel ought to be, and I did find what looks like a mound. We see it here. Betelgeuse ought to be at a place called Rubina Hill, or Rhubarb Hill, which is covered in trees. So perhaps there is a mound underneath there somewhere. This exercise is interesting, but for me, it hasn't really proved much. So in order to get more information, I asked Ross if I could speak to Steve Willits, who has done a lot more research into this subject. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Steve Willits. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thank you for having me on. Uh, now, uh, as you saw, uh, we couldn't get Orion to line up with the mounds. Now, you've been researching this subject for three years now. For three years, yes. And, um, you, and you, you, you yourself started looking at Wilson and Blackett's work. Uh, and, yeah. and I believe that you tried to do an exercise similar to what Ross and I did. Yeah. Uh, so, and you had similar problems. So can you just explain that first? Now, what I got is just like a planosphere, um, just a map of the stars. And every time I placed that on that central belt of Orion, I could never get anything to work. Um, even if you turn it upside down, it doesn't work. Mm. Um, and I, I think I tried it maybe 40, 50 times in different ways. Um, just putting it on the on the Garth Mountain, but at different angles. Right. Uh, maybe they just used the, the Garth and put the three mounds there, but it at the wrong angle. I, so I was trying to twist it, turn it, but still keeping those three stars on that mountain. Um, nothing worked, absolutely nothing. I, I couldn't get it to work. So what I started doing, and I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can work it up myself. Um, so I basically started translating all the place names. And not just in that area, I mean the whole of South East Wales. Trying to get clues of, you know, where would Gemini be, where would Cassiopeia be, see if you can get any clues. 
So as I was starting to translate all these names, you'd pick up the odd name and think, oh, right, that could be Scorpius. So you think, right, that's Scorpius up there, Orion's down there, put the planisphere over, see what it, it looks like, see if any mounds match up. If they don't, then move it and then translate again. Mm -hmm. And I think I spent maybe two years subtly adjusting it bit by bit, constantly adjusting, then translating the names. If that doesn't work, move it again, see if this lay on mounds, translate the names, until I eventually got the whole thing to work. Right. So just to interrupt you there, Steve, when you say names, so you're looking at the oldest Welsh names that you can find f yeah. for, the, for the geography, That's in, it, yeah. in, including some of the names of the mounds, yeah. and you're comparing that with, with what? Ah, right. Um, star constellations, but the oldest names. So Yeah, so these would be Babylonian star constellations. Right. right. Um, like Wilson and Black had said, ignore the Roman, ignore the Greek. Um, so you, I went back to Babylonian stuff mm -hmm. because they did say that they brought, when Albine came here, they brought their Chaldean culture with them. And the Chaldeans were from Babylonia. So I thought, well, maybe that's where I, where I should start. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at some of the old stories like uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the Enuma Elish, and, and those types of stories. And you could start to see clues in there. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, right, maybe it is Babylonian. Uh, and then there was another fantastic book which came out, I think, at the same time, the same year, or the year after Wilson and Blackett released Ark of the Covenant, which was Babylonian st Star Law by Gavin White. And he went through the book, uh, the whole Babylonian Star Law, like a compendium. So he gave all the attributes, all what he thinks all these different characters, all these gods, all these constellations represent. Mm -hmm. So he's catalogued the Babylonian naming of stars? Basically, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that was a godsend. Um, it was written in not academic sort of literature, which can be difficult to interpret sometimes. Right. So you look at it and you go, ah, right. And the first one I looked at was um, the wolf, constellation of the wolf. Um, we're in Babylonia, all large carnivores were classed as ferocious warriors, for example. So the Wilson and Barker identified a man called Tawana Bloodyhead, which means the ferocious warrior or the, the fierce fighter. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you know that the fierce fighter or ferocious warrior is a wolf, and Bloodyhead means also wolf-like, mm -hmm. you then got one of the constellations. Right. So it's like, all right, I've got one now. So what's the place name? The modern day place name for that then? No, it's, it's the name of a mound, but it's near mm -hmm. a little village of Man Moyle, mm -hmm. uh, near Penavan Pond. Right. So it's over Blackwood, Oakdale. And what's the name of the mound? Towin Ablethiad. Right. Um, which, like I said, means wolf like. Mm -hmm. um, but it can also be some like fierce fighter, ferocious warrior. Right. And you've, you've compiled quite a database now mm -hmm. where you've matched a Babylonian naming of a star to some place or mound in yeah. Wales. Just tell yeah. us how many. Right. And not every uh, cane or mound has got a name. Um, so there, there are quite a few. So I got, a, I'm not sure how many, I guess, say 20 with a name associated with it. Mm -hmm. There's another, say, 40, 50, where it doesn't have a name to them, the, the mound itself. But the, the names of the places around there match that mound, right. or, or what it should be. Right. So then you, you, you build them. I, I got maybe close to 100 of the stars. Right. Right. And you started mapping them out yeah. and comparing it in, in detail with, yeah. with the constellations. That's it, yeah. All right. So, <coughs> you, so, you, so from that research, Steve, mm. you believe that, um, that Orion is, is in a slightly different place to where we were trying to place it. That's it, yeah. It's... So, so we'll, we'll just bring up this map now on the screen. I can put that on the screen now. And if you just talk us through your map, uh, Steve, and, and just show us the overlay of, uh, of Orion on the, on the ground as well. OK, yeah. If, if you look, there's a figure on there. And uh, if you look with this helmet, that's where the Garth Mountain is. And that's where the three mounds of Orion. So if you look where I've got them, it's actually 
below the Garth Mountain, um, very close to the M4. Mm -hmm. Now, in that location, um, some of it's built on. There's a railway going, a railway line going through where I think one should be. There's a Henstaff Court, is where another, and the other one I am being able to gain access to it. But all those three points are on local high points. So you've got rounded three sort of little, slightly higher places in, in the surrounding area in, in the same position. Now you've got also to identify them, you've got three different names next to them. So the first star, on the Attack, for example, um, is called, not the mound itself, but there's a farm there called Gada Wen. Um, Gada meaning chair or throne, and Wen can mean white or it can mean like a beautiful maiden. Mm -hmm. From, from Gwen. So the, the next star, Al Nilam, is Hen Staff, which means old staff. And the third one is um, Floin Ioli, which means something like, um, Ioli means something like to, to beg or to pray or to mm -hmm. ask for some help then. Mm -hmm. So those three names um, are quite significant because they then match um, three characters in the Epic of Gilgamesh, or the attributes of three characters in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So what I think's happened is those three stars on the top of the mound, on top of the Garth Mountain, are actually representing these three characters on a high point, because this is lower down. And you'd also need to work out what um, the Garth Mountain is. Now in Babylonian star law, um, you've got certain constellations are identified or associated with certain cities. Now, the true shepherd of Anu, which is the Babylonian name for this, um, the associated city is Uruk. So in the beginning of the Epic of Gilgamesh, it, it mentions that Uruk um, is the abode of Anu Ishtar, the place of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. So you've got three mounds up on what I believe represents, not is the actual city, because that's out in Iraq. This represents on the star mark the city of Uruk. Mm -hmm. So the three names next to these three stars in the belt of Orion below are attributes of certain characters, like Gadawen, um, Ishtar, for example, planted a tree so she could um, build a chair out of it. So you got the, the chair. Uh, Gilgamesh um, was known as the shepherd of Oroch, and he's quite often seen with a staff in his hand. So you got the staff in the middle. And Gilgamesh was also terrorizing the city of Oroch, all the people. And then you got sorry, Eoli, which then means um, to beg, to pray, because the people we're begging and pray, praying to Anu. So those three mounds on the top of the Garth represent these three characters, I believe, in the shape of the belt of Orion. But the belt of Orion on the star map is lower down. Right. Does that make? Yeah, and yeah. what about the outlying stars? So you've got them marked on the map there. They've got them marked on the map. Um, right, the first one, which is Betelgeuse on the shoulder, on that location is a burial chamber. Now what's significant about that star there um, is another guy, Hugh Heavens, um, has written a book, um, The Star Map of Gwynedd. Now he has Betelgeuse on, on Manith Ru Saison. And right, ne right next to this star is Ru Saison. Right. So you've got the same star, mm -hmm. the same name in two different locations, right. Ru Saison, which I think it's significant in itself, right. um, which then leads to the question, what does that name really mean? Mm -hmm. um, below Betelgeuse, then, you got safe. Mm -hmm. And right on target, as you can see, the, the planisphere is overlaid onto these dots. Right on target there, you've got a mot, mm -hmm. now, which is just a busy and earthen mound. Now, as far as moths are concerned, there are a number which are marked as moths. Mm -hmm. They may have been repurposed at some stage, mm -hmm. but that could have originally been a star mount. Mm -hmm. 
because yeah. it's it's in the right location. So you got these two. You got actually something far. Bellatrix um, in that location is uh, Craig Park, I think, is it? And there's a homestead right on location. Um, how old that is, or whether or not it was a homestead, or whether or not there was something next to it, is unsure. But the name Craig a Park means the stone park suggests it could be something there. I, I would need to get to, to that place to, to check, mm -hmm. but that was right on location for that one. Then you got Rigel at the bottom. Now that is in right in the middle of a field. Um, and there's, if, if you just look at normal maps, you can't see anything. But if you look at the LIDAR, you can just make out lumps and bumps under the ground. Right. Um, um, this area is quite heavily farmed, so that could have quite easily been ploughed out. Right. Um, but that's all I got to go for with that. It's just these, under the surface, you can just make out these lumps right on target. Okay. And then you've got all the bar and then. Which isn't part of Orion. Which isn't part of Orion. All the bar barren in the Babylon Babylonian terms um, is the jaw of the bull of heaven right. and is part of Taurus. Right. And that is smack on then for the mot in Morganstown. Right. So you so, got so the, the, the mot that Ross and I visited in Morganstown was actually Aldebaran. No, all the barren, yeah, Aldebaran, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. well, yeah. 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 <laughs> some people say, some <laughs> so, say, yeah, that's it. It has different pronunciations, yeah. Um, okay. Now, so you've done this with all of the constellations, with all of them, uh, yes. and you're working on it now. So you think that you you may have your book ready within the next six months at some point, Ho possibly sooner, but yeah, six months definitely. I would say yes. Right. All right. And um, if anyone who's interested, um, if they keep an eye on Ross's website, because Ross is going to help you publish it and That's, can yeah. contribute to it as yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess w what you're intending to do is to provide details of this very interesting mm. star mound map uh, yeah. and um, yeah I think it's it's just a fascinating subject and presumably the ancients for some reason when they came here mm. they wanted to record part of their history on the landscape on the landscape yes yeah for, for, for whatever reason and they yeah. and it's for some reason it's linked to the yeah. heavens and, and it's not just the stars are mapped out that just provides the backdrop for all these sort of ancient stories that seem to be encoded in the landscape. Right. All right, and Steve, it's fascinating stuff, and I uh, really appreciate you coming in to explain all that. And um, we're going to go back to Ross now and just get a few finishing comments from him. And, and just yeah. to mention that, um, you know, if you want to get in touch with Ross, get onto his YouTube channel, which is Britain's Hidden History, uh, because you're welcome chat. In there. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, you know, there's constant chat going on. Keep it polite and family friendly. That's the only rules we have. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you've had information from uh, people that you've then gone and investigated various sites that, that mm. nobody knows about. Yeah, I do a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, like uh, Len Crowther. I want to give Len a mention because he's wonderful. I'm not sure how old he is, but he knew Alan Wilson back in the 80s, maybe even mm. late 70s. Mm -hmm. And when Alan was helping organise the local rugby and that, he was trying to get Len to play. And so took Len under his wing a bit, and one of Len's friends. We went to various historical locations, which Len says, at the time, you weren't that bothered, but you always got a pint and a bag of crisps at the end of the trip. So he <laughs> used to quite like going along. But Alan must have lit a flame, because he's still interested now. Yeah. And in our local area, he, is, he showed me another mound. Uh, perhaps we can show a clip of that. It, yeah. was, a, it was a few weeks ago, yeah. which I didn't know about. And that fills in one of the key... Uh, stars. Gaps, if you like, yeah, yeah, one of the stars on there. Right. So Len's still finding other stuff, and he's and I've done a few trips with him. So that's the kind of thing I show on my channel. What I try and do is have um, during a week, under ten minutes, I'm trying to get another seven or eight minutes, uh, almost every day. There's a little nugget, if you like, mm -hmm. and then reports from on site, and then the roundup and the news and the chat every Sunday. So it's quite a regime. Right. That's why it's not got the production values you have. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, Nothing yeah, as professional I, I, as this, I, I'm afraid. I, um, I, you know, I take my hat off to you to, to, <laughs> that you're putting stuff out every single day. Uh, so that would uh, most days, yeah, uh, most days, uh, and doing a weekly live show as well. Yes, so, yes, yeah, that's yes. pretty commendable. Thank you. Uh, and you know, uh, again, if you want to get on Ross's channel, it's Britain's Hidden History. So hopefully, you get a few more. Subscribe. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yes, please. Yeah, Is there anything else you want to uh, do? You want to add? 
We've covered a lot of. Grounds. We have covered a lot, haven't we? I mean, yeah. there is there is always more. I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, some of the other. Uh, I just want well, just give a quick mention here. This is uh, this is the book not by Wilson and Black. It was actually published. I give Robert Shaw a quick mention here, because this is brilliant. And this is um, what what excited me about this book. Um, well, I've I've had to help with the editing and publishing of this book. Is originally it was just a story about why these churches and the places they are, and you can see the Eye of Horus and how the City of London works on Egyptian principles, mm -hmm. which is ties in with all the other stuff, which is pretty weird. What really jumped off the page in me, though, is and I think people can associate with, is as recently as the 17th century, stories you know, like the first history story most people are taught in school is the Great Fire of London. We're all taught, you know, you know the Pudding yeah. Lane and the Baker and all this kind of stuff. Well, if you look into it, like Robert's done, all oh, that's nonsense. The, 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 the parliamentary report at the time completely exonerated the baker in that. It was a completely false story. And they actually captured arsonists. Right. And they were French arsonists. Mm. And the person going around setting the arsonists free was the royalty. It was right. Charles and his younger brother, um, you know, the, the Duke of York, and New York is named after. Mm. Jane. Uh, so, yeah, so they were... They were so the fire of London was a false flag organised by royal yes. royalty. Yeah. Yes. In short, <laughs> but that that yeah. gets you interested in it. What I'm trying to show to people is that this is this is quite recent, and you can see this. This ties yeah. in with a lot of your work without me getting myself into too much trouble here. Yeah. Not only was the the fire organised, but so was the Great Plague of London, the wars with Holland, and the famine that followed. They were the four biblical retributions, the four rides of the apocalypse, that they were bringing because their father, Charles the First, who they considered to be uh, God on earth, if you like. So it's deicide. They killed the king. Mm. They killed the god. And the people of London needed punishing. And this is crucial era, that late 17th century, because this is when we had the coup in mm -hmm. Britain, mm -hmm. when the Stuarts, the, royal, the ruling family, could trace its way back, was got rid of, were invaded by a foreign body under William of Orange. And since ever since then, we've had foreign rulers with the real power being the city. Because yeah. it's only a few years after this, the Glorious Revolution in 1688, six years later is when the Bank of England was formed, the maritime law was brought in, all these things which are so, uh, causing yeah. so many problems now, right. comes yeah. from that era as well, so it's interesting worth reading. Right, and you mentioned Charles there, so we now have a Charles III. King, King, King Charles III. So, so what, do you have an opinion on that? Well, I was surprised <laughs> he chose the name, because it was always used to be that he would choose something else, wasn't he, because it's such an unlucky name. What, which Charles? Is, yes, was rather unlucky, and if you look at Charles I. Right. Got so you think he was going to change his name? Well, for, for, most of them do, don't they, if you right. think about it. I mean, uh, uh, what was it? The last king was Albert was his name, wasn't it? But he became George VI, wasn't he? Right, right. They usually change. They're not, they have birth names they don't use. They use right. dynastic names. And Charles was, one of the rumours was he's going to be go as Arthur, because that's his second name. Now, the thing with Charles, you see, Charles the what, first. What, Prince Charles is all? Charles Arthur, yeah. His, his second name is Arthur. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, it's in his names, isn't it? I and mean, all his sons have. So if Arthur's a myth, why have so many royals got Arthur in their name? But that's another, that's when we come on to yeah. the Adrian Gilbert stuff and things. But, the, um, yeah, so Charles the first was the one who had his head chopped off at the mm. end of the Civil War, as described in here. Mm. Charles the second, his son, was most likely um, poisoned or murdered because he made a right mess of everything. Mm. Uh, so they didn't think they'd have another Charles as a uh, name for the king. So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, well, God save the king and all that, you know. Right. I'm trying to get over my trauma <laughs> <laughs> of the change of uh, oh, dear. an epoch or whatever they've been described as, change of an era. Yeah, I I'm interested. You're coping well, Richard, I have to say. Well, uh, I've been recording this when it's, the news is very fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested to see what the coronation's going to look like. Because if, if, if the ceremony is the same as the, they did in the, in the, the 1950s, QB2, yes. uh, it's just going to seem a bit... Just ridiculous. Yeah, I, th I, I can't see why it wouldn't be. Right. Yeah. Oh well, we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Because I don't we'll, know when it is. Everyone watching this will know we don't. So there we are. Yeah. All right then, Ross. Really appreciate you coming in. And, oh uh, man, we, thank you very much. I've got to say, this has been such a, 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 a privilege and a dream to come on your show. I'm so done. excited, and, and there's so many people, myself included, who wouldn't know about any of this work. And I think this would have gone. This would have disappeared. Yeah. One of the expressions I use is that back in the 80s. British history 
was hanging on by its fingernails. Mm -hmm. And Wilson and Blackett came and dragged it up to the top of this cliff, and it was mm -hmm. starting to fall back in again, and we're here to try and save it, and you've been a big part of that, so thank you very much. Well, ironically, it wasn't really the history that I was particularly interested no, in. No, was in the fire, it was, it was the fact that they were trying to kill them. <laughs> yes. Right? And do, and do everything, and destroy them. Thanks. That was That was what... Well, for obvious reasons, uh, I don't really like know, that part of the no, story. No, but I mean, the, his the history is clearly very important. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, as we have this, for whatever reason, they, they've been attacked so much, and we've, we have discussed some of that. Um, but well, like one say, reason, like, if you're talking about change of new king, I mean, if, if you've got a situation where you've got a legitimate royal family that goes back to, say, 500 BC, well, that predates the Normans by one and a half thousand years, so... Yeah. Yeah. You can understand why it's a political threat, yeah, can't you? Absolutely. All right then, oh, Ross, sorry, yeah. Yeah. and believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.